Uttarakhand and Himalaya has told me this, that when he was a young boy, he used to go to a sadhu on the bank of the Ganga near his village who would teach Vedanta. So people in the village, small group would gather around. One day, this boy, he went there and there was only he was there and the sadhu was there. Nobody else had come. The sadhu was surprised and asked, where are they all? Satsangi, those who have come for satsanga, for Vedanta Shravana. And he, he said, a tantric has come there. So everybody has gone, gone there. <laughs> the, a tantric has come and displaying tantric powers there. And the sadhu sadly said, this is always the condition of Vedanta. Yehi Vedanta ki halat hoti hai. There was a movie about Shankaracharya many years ago when you were kids. It's in Sanskrit. So uh, on Indian TV, Doordarshan, they used to sh show it. So there's a very, f it was amusing the way they showed. Shankaracharya, the young boy, has gone to his teacher, Gaurapada. And Gaurapada, not Gaurapada, Govindapada. Govindapada teaches him Vedanta and finally gives him the mission to revive Vedanta. So go around India and revive uh, Advaita Vedanta. But the way they showed it in the movie was amusing. He invited him into the deeper recesses of the cave and pulled out some worm eaten manuscripts. See the poor condition of Vedanta. Will you please <laughs> read <rejoin? laughs> And Shankaracharya says, Yes, yes, I will <laughs> revive this Vedanta. So that's always the condition what to do. The brave few have turned up. <laughs> But the good stuff has been reserved for the last uh, afternoon session, which is going to come up. Some very deep and interesting stuff. We'll see. Okay. Is it time to start? Yes. Om Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityur ma amritam gamaya, om shanti shanti shanti. Om lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness unto light, lead us from death to immortality. Om peace, peace, peace. Let us chant Om at our own pace for a couple of minutes. Om. To center ourselves, notice that we are here, here, here in this chair, sitting now, now, now. I, I, me, myself, be aware of oneself. Here, now, I. So, I want to start off. Before taking up the next verse, there was a question about the structure of spiritual practice, sadhana. Who had asked the gentleman? You were there. You had asked, yes. That's right. So the question is spiritual practice in Advaita Vedanta. It goes like this um, Advaita Vedanta, this text, and all Advaitic texts tell us the simple truth that you are limitless existence, consciousness, place, and as such, there is no problem at all. There never was, there isn't, there won't ever be. When we hear that, 
uh, we scratch our heads and say, oh, that's nice, but I don't feel that way. It's not a fact for me. So that moment we say, it's not a fact for me. I don't feel that way. I don't get it. It's not real for me. It's not real for me. I don't get it. It's not a fact for me. This is called ajnana, ignorance. So we are admitting that if it is true, if Vedanta is at all true, in that case, it's something unknown to me right now, even if I've read it. So it is igno ignorance, which is the problem. Then what is the solution for ignorance? Knowledge. For any ignorance, the solution is knowledge. If I'm ignorant of Spanish, then I have to get knowledge of Spanish. If I'm ignorant of Sanskrit grammar, I have to get knowledge of Sanskrit grammar. So ignorance, uh, the solution is knowledge. Knowledge of what? The same thing that I'm ignorant about. There's a saying about knowledge and ignorance. How it works is, Vishaya and Adhishthana must be same. Vishaya means the object of knowledge and object of ignorance must be the same. What is the object of my ignorance? What am I ignorant about? Spanish. Then what should the knowledge be about? It can't be about physics. Won't work. It should be about Spanish. Yes. And so the object of ignorance and knowledge must be the same. And also what is called Adhishthana, the location, the locus of ignorance and knowledge must be the same for knowledge to remove ignorance. Locus means where is this ignorance? If I am ignorant, the knowledge of my guru will not remove my ignorance. If I am ignorant, the knowledge that is in this book will not remove my ignorance until there's knowledge in my mind. The knowledge must, it's, it's a no-brainer, This basically, this, but this has to be kept in mind. So knowledge and ignorance must have the same object and same locus. Uh, Vishaya Adhishthana must be same. So what is the object of ignorance here? My own real nature. Why would you say that? Because the Vedanta is telling me my real nature is Brahman, is limitless consciousness existence. Mm. And I don't seem to think that I, I think I know myself, but what I know about myself flat out contradicts what the text is telling me. So I am ignorant about my own nature. The object of my ignorance is my own nature. I don't know what Bra Vedanta tells me about my own nature. I do not know that. Or at least it's not real to me. And of course, the locus of this ignorance is in my mind. Remember, ignorance is not in the body. Ignorance is not in Atman, in pure consciousness. Ignorance is in the mind. So knowledge must come in the mind. Where else will ignorance be? It can't be in your knee or your elbow. It has to be in the mind. That's where near ignorance and knowledge are. So knowledge has to be generated in the mind. What is the method to be followed in Vedanta to generate knowledge? Shravana, manana, nididhyasana. Any kind of knowledge. Wherever we go to school, this is basically the method. You have to learn, think about it, and then sort of assimilate that knowledge. So shravana, manana, nididhyasana. Listen, reflect upon it, and assimilate it through meditation. Re listen, reflect, meditate. So make three columns. Problem, solution, method. Problem, solution, method. So first column is problem. Problem is ignorance. And keep in mind why this problem arose. Because when you're told about the Vedantic teaching, we admit this is not real to me. This is, I don't know this. I don't understand this. So ignorance is the problem. And the solution is knowledge. But the method to generate that knowledge is this, what we are doing now. Shavana, Manana, Nididhyasana. We are hearing these texts. We are hopefully reflecting upon it. And uh, eventually, when we get clarity, we will meditate upon this. But there's a problem here now. The problem is we will say, again, we will scratch our heads and say, um, nothing you say is new to us, Swami. I have been listening to Vedanta before you were born. <laughs> So Shavana Manana is all this is going on for decades. No knowledge has come. I mean, no enlightenment has come. A lot of knowledge has come. Many notebooks, uh, many uh, you know, downloaded lectures and whatnot. I listened to many lectures, many YouTube talks, read many books, purchased many more than I have read. Yeah. So all of that is there, but no knowledge has come. Then the problem is, is not at this level. There's a deeper uh, level problem that is, uh, is, it's called restless mind. Restless mind is the problem. In Sanskrit, vikshepa. Restless mind is the problem. And the solution for restless mind is focused mind. Focus. In Sanskrit, ekagrata, one-pointedness. And the method for getting that focused mind is upasana, meditation, yoga, upasana. So meditation is the way of getting that focused mind. Problem? Restless mind. What was the first layer of problem? Ignorant mind. 
ಸೊಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಮೆಥಡ್ ಶ್ರವಣ ಮನನ ನಿಧಿಧ್ಯಾಸನ ಇನ್ ಒನ್ ಒನ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಯೋಗ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಯೋಗ ಇಸ್ ದ ಮೆಥಡ್ ಬಟ್ ದೆನ್ ದರ್ ಇಸ್ ಅನದರ್ ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಪ್ರಯರ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ರೆಸ್ಟ್ಲೆಸ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸೊಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಫೋಕಸ್ಡ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಮೆಥಡ್ ಉಪಾಸನ ಇನ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಯೋಗ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ಕಾಂಬಿನೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ರಾಜ ಯೋಗ ಅಂಡ್ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಯೋಗ ಡಿವೋಷನ್ there is a lot to be said here i'm just giving you the outline devotion and meditation is the uh, solution again we will scratch our head and say that also i have tried swami ji i have been meditating for years and years either i fall asleep or i get restless these are the two problems in meditation laya vikshepa so then the, there is another layer of problems third layer and this is the last one <laughs> so third layer of problems that is called impure mind impure mind in sanskrit chitta mala chitta mala impurity of mind solution to impure mind again no brainer pure mind chitta shuddhi purification of the mind chitta shuddhi in many of our texts you will see this is repeated again and again what is necessary is chitta shuddhi chitta shuddhi impure mind not allowing us to meditate our minds are either restless or they fall asleep if you put pressure on a mind and to meditate it will become restless put more pressure it will fall asleep put even more pressure the mind will break you will become insane i have seen people becoming um, so mental breakdown from too much effort at meditation hours and hours and hours day after day without preparation uh, so what is the preparation purification of mind the purification of mind is the uh, basic is is where we begin spiritual life that is the important thing in spiritual life we have put a lot of rubbish into our minds and that's why the minds are very impure impure minds are always disturbed and disturbed minds cannot grasp even if the knowledge is given it can't grasp it can't hold they say in hindi pachta nahi hai mahatma ji you are unable to digest it <laughs> you get it but it's like food which you can't digest it gives your stomach upset that's all so now what is the method for a purification of mind many methods are there most powerful method is called karma yoga that work which i used to do selfishly now i try to do selflessly one very good way of doing selflessly is to bring bring god into the equation that i do, do it as a service of the lord my beloved krishna rama uh, jesus christ in whichever form we worship god as a service to the lord in service of the lord it may be just your job it may be exactly what you are getting paid for that also can be done as a service to the lord internal it's an internal attitude remember arjuna was a warrior before the bhagavad gita krishna taught him karma yoga after that also he was a warrior he did exactly the same job but the attitude will change inside so now we have the matrix it's complete i said three columns what are the three columns first one problem second one solution third one method and three rows one row is problem is ignorant mind solution is knowledge method is gyana yoga what is gyana yoga shravana manana nidhyasana next level layer of problems problem is impure mind no problem is restless mind solution focused, focused mind method upasana what does that consist of raja yoga and bhakti yoga meditation and devotion why meditation devotion there is a lot to be said about that but it's a whole different topic what exactly constitutes what does meditation do and what does devotion do meditation focuses the mind devotion focuses all our our feelings it takes our 100 different desires which are flowing out to the world futile flowing out to the world futile there will be no quenching of the desire in the world this was the great insight of bhagwan buddha trishna this hunger for the world cannot be quenched by the world can it be quenched yes it can be quenched by god so we collect those desires and focus it towards god into one almighty love of god it's bhakti you can see how that will calm and settle the mind our minds are constantly desires because we we are constantly restless because we hanker after dozen different things or we are worried about many things in the world restless mind see the mind is restless one sign is it chatters you may sit here quietly but you are not quiet mind is chattering it may be telling you uh, so many things did i lock the car properly 
when will it end and <laughs> <laughs> this and that or your mind will rebel and say no 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 i'm thinking about vedantic things ah, that's also your chattering mind is chattering one very humorous swami is there his name is called the smiling swami he is always actually smiling his name is anubhavananda saraswati he came to visit us in new york he gave a talk there also and hollywood also came and gave a talk he is like the traditional indian wandering monk only in in, in ancient times the wandering monk is to go from village to village here he goes from country to country <laughs> all over the world throughout year after year decade after decade he is always constantly moving from country to anyway so he puts very profound things in a very light way humorous way he puts it very profoundly so he says chattering chattering you're constantly talking to ourselves and then he says uh, you try this just now just now you try it do two things sit quietly don't talk to yourself one stop tell the mind stop and two because if you simply stop the mind will say now what do i do <laughs> listen listen to the sound of peace listen to the sound of peace stop thinking stop chattering mentally listen to the sound of peace do it for one minute you are comfortable can gently open your eyes you see it works one minute two minutes at least everyone can feel it <laughs> it's a relief make that it's like a little kid chattering away stop listen to the sound of peace so this is um it's just a taste of what meditation can do for you but it must also be supported by bhakti bhakti is very powerful why devotion to god why a lot of our chattering is due to our externalized mind mind running towards many things in the world in hope in fear in terror in temptation in anxiety in ex expectation minds are going out there if you take the whole thing and leave it to god surrender to the lord let the lord take care of it actually the lord is taking care of us we don't we don't trust the lord <laughs> so and then only the mind will calm down but still it will not work because even then it will not work because desires are are driven into the mind purification of the mind is necessary if we protest no my mind is not impure one test is there to so, swami prabhavanand ji who was the head of our vedanta society in hollywood he gave this test he said that uh, just sit quietly and try to think of god suppose someone has a mantra om namah shivaya or something try to do it for one minute only you will notice very soon within seconds some other thought will come up you have yourself decided to do think one thing for a very short period of time still you cannot this is a sign of mental impurity some conditioning of the mind negative conditioning of the mind which keeps on generating uh, endless disturbances so purification of the mind has to be done uh, and the method powerful method is karma yoga um, usually all our life is selfish to make it selfless same work do it as a worship of god or as a worship of the world god in all in the world in all beings in office at home wherever so you have the matrix of sadhana now notice karma yoga bhakti yoga raj yoga gyan yoga are all there however there is a hierarchy and this is this is classical advaita vedanta there is a hierarchy the basic basic purification is done by karma yoga but that will not lead to enlightenment then further purification and concentration is done by bhakti yoga and raja yoga still it will not lead to enlightenment so interesting in the classical advaita vedanta neither bhakti nor meditation will lead to enlightenment it has to be shravana manana nidhyasana gyana yoga which will generate what will lead to enlightenment gyana yoga will generate the way of knowledge will generate knowledge knowledge will remove ignorance and that will lead to enlightenment realization that you are brahman which was already there 
A purified mind, sit down for meditation, mind will become calm immediately. With a purified and calm mind, listen to these teachings, very quickly enlightenment will result. Knowledge will arise and remove ignorance in our minds. So this is the structure of sadhana, spiritual uh, practice in Advaita Vedanta. So should I do Karma Yoga 20 years, then meditate for 10 years, then come to your retreat? Too late. <laughs> All of them have to go on together. All of them have to go on together. Now, further point. This is the structure according to classical Advaita Vedanta, which we are studying. However, this structure is changed uh, according to your, your uh, tradition. It, if you are a Vishishta Advaita, Advaita Vedanta, in one of the dualistic paths, the devotional paths, Karma Yoga is still useful, but there, by, by bhakti, by devotion, you will get enlightenment. You will get freedom from samsara, not by knowledge. So, so the structure is changed there because they don't accept that you are Brahman and ignorance is the problem and then knowledge will remove the ignorance. That whole paradigm is not accepted. In Hinduism, one has to realize there are multiple paradigms. That's why people find it very confusing. It's very, somebody said it's open architecture. And open system. Another, uh, there's a book, uh, Religion in the 21st Century, and, this, and the chapter on Hinduism, the author, a, a professor, he wrote, Hinduism is perhaps the world's only postmodern religion. <laughs> so it's the most ancient living religion in the world, and now they're saying it's the most postmodern religion also. But the reason is, uh, it's vast, and many, many paradigms are there, and they're all true, they all work. We are talking about one very high, very subtle, very powerful paradigm, which is Advaita Vedanta. But there are other paradigms and they view spiritual practice differently. This has to be kept in mind because I just gave you one structure. That may not be the structure which others accept or even you are following. You might be following some other structure. That's also valid. There are those who will say that Karma Yoga is useful for purification. Somehow Karma Yoga is always the you know preliminary thing. <laughs> and then it is through meditation alone you will get enlightenment. Patanjali Yoga, Yoga Sutras, if we take it up. There they don't say you have to purify the mind and then you have to um, meditate and then finally go to Upanishads and then that will give you, or Vedanta, Yoga Vashishta Sara and that will give you enlightenment. They never say that. Patanjali Yoga Sutra says you sit in this way, breathe in this way, focus, withdraw in this way and focus in this way, you will get Samadhi that will lead to enlightenment. So these are different paradigms. So that's what you have to keep in mind. The basic methods are spiritualizing work, karma yoga, focusing our emotions or wants on God, bhakti yoga, quietening the mind, settling the mind, stilling the mind, that is raja yoga, and then generating knowledge about our real nature, that is jnana yoga. Swami Vivekananda gave a generalized model. In Sanatana Dharma, generally all these yogas are there. He is the one who generalized all the spiritual paths into these four yogas. Because if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, each chapter is called a yoga. 18 chapters. 18 chapters are called different yogas. Even the first one, Arjuna Vishada Yoga, the yoga of depression. <laughs> Most important yoga. Spiritual life does not begin unless you are depressed. The yoga of depression. This Even this book, it came out of depression. Ramachandra was depressed. And his father told Vashishta to go, please go and speak to the boy. <laughs> and so the whole dialogue is between the sage and a depressed teenager. <laughs> so that's the, the, the whole book. Um, so in Vivekananda classified all of these paths. Many, many different paths and techniques are there. Basically a meditative path, a philosophical inquiry path, a devotional path, and a path of spiritualizing work, our action. Uh, so he said, the goal is, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity already within us. Do it either by philosophy, that is Jnana Yoga, by psychic control, that is Raja Yoga, by love, that is Bhakti Yoga, or by work, by service, selfless service, that is Karma Yoga, by one or more or all of these, and be free, that is the whole of spirituality, whole of religion. Books, temples, doctrines, churches are secondary details. So this is all about spiritual practice. Now let us go ahead. I will direct our attention to verse number 11. In between the ones which we have skipped, what, is, what has been said there? Importance of holy company. 
importance of holy company has been stressed in multiple verses, which I'm we saw a little bit yesterday, and now I'm skipping to verse number eleven. Verse number eleven will tell us, introduce us to the unique method of Jnana Yoga. Remember, Jnana Yoga. What is the unique method of Raja Yoga? Meditation. What is the unique method of Bhakti Yoga? Love of God. What is the unique method of Karma Yoga? Selfless service. What is the unique method of Jnana Yoga? Inquiry. And in inquiry, what do you use? My intellect. So that is the you know, that is the subject here. Verse eleven. Please repeat after me. Upadesha Kramo Rama, Upadesha Kramo Rama, Vyavastha Matra Palanam, Vyavastha Matra Palanam, Yaptes to Karanam Shuddham, Yaptes to Karanam Shuddham, Shisha Prajeva Kevala, Shisha Prajeva Kevala. O Rama, the customary method of instruction given by the Guru to the disciple is merely to honor the tradition. But the student's sharp intellect, fit for discernment, ah, so not discrimination here, fit for discernment is the only unadulterated cause for the disciple's knowledge. So it's done here. See, he has pointed out something central here. What really counts in your spiritual quest is you, is the student. It's not so much the skill in instruction, not so much the latest and most fascinating technique on YouTube, not the latest publication from Harvard University Press, not how great the teacher is, how impressive the teacher, none of them. They're all, he says, Vyavastha um, Matrapalaram, just to follow a tradition, just to follow a set formula, really what matters is you. And in this case, what matters is your sharp and subtle and pure intellect. Swami Bhuteshanandaji was the 12th president of our order. He used to say in Bengali, Shuddha buddhi, Shukha buddhi nai. Pure intellect, not sharp intellect. intellect. Pure intellect also will be sharp, but there are a lot of people who have sharp intellects. And the result is of the sharp intellect is agnosticism. Oh, I don't believe in that stuff. <laughs> That's the ultimate result of sharp intellect. Pure intellect, which will, the pure mind flows automatically Godward. You may not use the word God towards spiritual life. So, shishya pragyaiva kevala, the fitness of the disciple, the fitness of the seeker. And here particularly, the pragya, the wisdom, the, the pure intellect of the uh, seeker is important. In the notes, he has mentioned a few verses. I will just read out some of those verses and then move on. Importance of the student. Then there is a further note on the four kinds of intellect, which is slightly insulting when you will we'll get to it. <laughs> but first, a few quote, quotations, well-known Sanskrit verses. I'm just reading it out. Yasya pragyaswayam nasti shastram tasya karoti kim lochanabhyam vihi nasya darpana kim karishyati if one does not have the cap capacity or fitness, what can the text do? So if I do not have eyes, if I close my eyes, what can a mirror do? The text is as good as a mirror. No more than that. We must know how to use it. So I Vivekananda said, a fool may um, buy the whole library. A fool may buy a whole library, but he will read only the books he deserves to read. What he, <laughs> what he means by that is um, notice how certain things make sense to us at different times in our life. It's just that we have become fit for that now. We have reached maturity and it clicks for us. I remember, it, it could be, they're all spiritual seekers. We all want enlightenment, but still uh, readiness is everything. Different things appeal to us at different stages in our life. Um, I remember reading Swami Vivekananda's Raja Yoga, his translation of the Yoga Sutras, when I was 10 or 11 years old. I was fascinated, but fascinated by what? In the third chapter, the various superpowers are described. You can read people's minds, you can float up in the sky, and things like that. Wow, I said, this is very nice. It's okay for a 10-year-old to be fascinated by that, but that's not the point of the Yoga Sutras. Point is enlightenment, so you have to move on from that. 
but it's not a question of being 10 or 11 years old. There are people who are 50 years old who for the first time become interested in spiritual life and what interests them in spiritual life is, can I float up in the air? Can I read other people's thoughts? Wow. That's where we are beginning. No harm, but quickly move on. Yeah, move on quickly <laughs> towards the real stuff. A monk, I remember, we're discussing Vedanta, a young uh, novice who had come to the monastery and we're discussing Vedanta that um, the Drik Drishya Vivek, the method of the seer and the seen, uh, and I am the witness consciousness. And he was nice, nice, that's nice, nice. And then in one place, the puja was being taught. And the part of the puja is to train you in pranayama, controlling of the breath. So the teacher, the master said, uh, breathe in through your left nostril, use the thumb to close your right nostril, count to four. I'm not teaching you, don't do that. <laughs> Then block both of your nostrils like this, count to 16, and then release eight, eight counts on the right nostril. Breathe in four counts on the right nostril, block both nostrils, release uh, left nostril, uh, eight, 16 counts, hold on, and then release eight counts on left nostril. That is one pranayama. And then the novice told me, wow, this is what I wanted. <laughs> so all Vedanta, pure consciousness, the world is an appearance, all that's nice, good philosophy. But this one, wow. <laughs> that's, my, that's my level, what can I do? That's what fascinates me. But luckily, in Sanatana Dharma, in Hinduism, whole spectrum is there. Whole spectrum is there. Some are fascinated by subtle philosophy. Some are fascinated by, um, by selfless love of God. Some want to uh, dedicate their lives in service to the divinity in all beings. Some love music, devotional music, singing the you know, love of God. Uh, some love rituals. Puja and Arati and various kinds of rituals. They really, I've seen Pujaris who do it well with a uh, genuine devotion for the Lord. All of those are provided for and they're good. One must know, one sadhu put it very nicely. In Hindi, he said, Apni sachai swikar karna bhot bhari baat hoti hai, Mahatma ji. To, to acknowledge one's own truth internally, you don't have to confess it to anybody. Internally to acknowledge and be honest with oneself. This is what appeals to me. This is what works for me. I know the whole path, but I have to start here. That's good. That's honest. And that will lead to quick progress. Then Vivek Churamani Shankaracharya says, Adhikari nama shaste phala siddhi visheshata upaya desha kaladya santyasmin sahakarinaha in order to get the result of any spiritual practice, purity of mind, concentration, meditation, devotion, and of course, knowledge, any, any path, what is required is the adhikari, the preparation of the student. Proper preparation is required. Upaya, various techniques, the holy place, holy time, all of these, the many things which are in spiritual life, those he says, sahakarina, they are supporting. As Vivekananda said, secondary details. Books, temples, doctrines, churches, secondary details. They are there to help you. They are there to help us. But they will by themselves, just by following a method, can I become enlightened? No. Unless you are ready. Unless mind is pure and you really want that enlightenment. Last word, Ashtavakra. He is straightforward and blunt. He says, Yatha deshena Kritartha sattva buddhiman ajivam api jigyasu paras tatra vimuhyati yathatatha upadesha, you know, he says, by casual instruction, by casual instruction, kritartha, enlightened, fulfilled, sattva buddhiman, the one whose mind is purified, focused, by just casual instruction. You are Brahman. See, you are not the body. You are not the mind. You are that which is witnessing the body-mind. That which is witnessing the body-mind is limitless awareness. No problem there. Finish. Done. Thank you. Goodbye. You'll say. In Keno Upanishad, the Acharya, the master, tests the student. He says, do you think you know Brahman? If you think you know Brahman, you know very little of Brahman. And then the student says, uh, I do know it, but 
you can see the teacher saying, ah, then you don't know it. <laughs> he says, no, not that I say that I know it as an object. And anyone here who has understood what I have said also knows Brahman. So everybody else is looking puzzled and that, that student, so the fit student was understood. So, yatha tatha upadeshena. Some progress very fast. See, I have been with a community of monks for the last 30 years. And I also had the privilege and blessing to teach young monks, those who come to be monks. So they're all spiritual seekers, all sincere, hardworking spiritual seekers, good people. But they're all very different from each other. So there's a whole, you'll find a bell curve. There are um, those who progress very fast. That it's a joy for them to get up long before sunrise. It's a joy for them to rush to the temple and spend long hours in the silence in the holy place meditating in the morning. It's a joy for them to serve uh, other monks and you know uh, do the manual work of cleaning the uh, shrine or whatever. It's a joy for them. They're very interested in the teachings, in the, in the scriptures, in the books. But they attend the classes with joy. Their hearts are full of devotion. I've seen, for the Lord. Then there are these, these opposite end of the bell curve. Getting up early in the morning is a, what is it called? Drag. <laughs> now see, these are not uh, the, the ordinary run of people. They have come to be monks, but still they find it struggle. Oh, getting up early in the morning, I'm so sleepy. Meditation after that, oh, very difficult, I feel sleepy. Study is so boring. Same thing, you are Brahman again and again. <laughs> Manual work. How can I get out of it? How can I do the least possible? <laughs> there are a few, there will be a few like that. For them, that life is, the whole thing becomes a struggle. They wanted it at one level of their minds. I want to become a monk and realize God, but I find the rest of my system is rebelling. It's not ready for it. It can happen. It can happen. In every system, you go to university, some students excel, some will be struggling. And the rest, most of them, the majority are in the middle somewhere. So he says, Yatha Tatha Upadeshana. Every instruction is taken up, and you see the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. When Swami Adbhutanandaji, he was scolded by Sri Ramakrishna for sleeping, um, you know, early, you go to bed. So sleeping throughout the night. He said, Have you come here to sleep? Just that much scolding. He stopped, stopped sleeping at night all his life after that. He would take a little nap in the morning. He would lie under this, what is called kambal, the, the blanket. People think, oh, he's sleeping. So, but whole night he would keep awake, meditate. Little instruction. I met a monk. He was an Irishman. In the, after the First World War, he was in Burma as a radio operator, what is now Myanmar. And he read about Swami Vivekananda, Raja Yoga book. He said, I want to become the disciple of this man. He didn't know so Vivekananda had passed away long ago. He came to India and he heard Vivekananda's passed away. It was all part of the same British Empire at that time. And then he heard about Swami Abhedananda, brother disciple of Vivekananda, who had gone back to India by that time, and who had an ashram in Darjeeling in West Bengal, in the hills. So this Irishman, he went up there and he started studying under Abhedanandaji. How I knew this. When I met him, he was a very old monk. He was nearly 90. And I was just new in that ashram in Deoghar. And every day in the evening, after Arati, he would do pranams to Sri Ramakrishna, Masharada, Vivekananda in the temple. And the pictures of the direct monastic disciples of Sri Ramakrishna were kept in the temple. So he would go around doing pranams to all of them. In the, the pictures, I would hold his hand and take him. And some of them he had met, actually. And he bowed down to the picture of Avedananda saying that I consider him my second guru. One day he teased me. He says, can you teach me a little Sanskrit? I, I thought he was, he was serious. I said, I know very little Swami. I can try. Then later I found out, what will I teach him Sanskrit? In the 1930s, he had studied Upanishads under Avedananda. <laughs> and um, he is a very profound, very good scholar. Anyway, the point I am trying to um, make is his guru was Swami Shivananda, the second president of our order. 
and his guru said to him, have you seen our new ashram in Deogar? Go and stay there. He just said to him, go and stay there. From that time onwards, 1930, I think, or earlier, before 1926, 27. From that time onwards, till the end of his life, for the more than, more than 60, 65 years, he stayed there. Because Guru has said. So these little instructions, Yatha Upadeshana. What about the rest? Ashtavakra says, Ajiva Mapi Jigyasu. All life they remain student. All life student. What's wrong in that? Never realizing, never graduating. Whole life on campus. <laughs> So it's good that they're seekers, but at one time you must find. Why, why remain seeker all your life? When will you find? There was a gentleman I knew, Badal Babu, very nice, uh, very devoted gentleman. Now in his early youth, he used to go to a great monk of our order, Swami Premeshananda, who was disciple of Holy Mother. And this is a young man's, uh, his thing was, he would go to different monasteries, dif meet different monks and come back and tell those sto stories to Swami Premier. You know, I met this Swami, he has this power. I met that Swami, he's like that. And one day, one day Swami Premier Shanji said, my dear boy, if the whole world becomes Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, everybody's not just a great sadhu, everybody becomes equal to Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Ultimately, what good is it to you or to me? Unless we realize something ourselves. You know? In Bengali, he said, Sara jagottai jodi ramkeshto hoye jai. <laughs> Tate tori vaki, amari vaki. What is it to you and what is it to me? So he says, Ajivam api jigyasu. They remain a spiritual seeker all their life. And Vimuhiyati, confused. Swami, I understood. But then I heard another talk on YouTube and he said like this, now I'm confused. More and more studying, more and more lectures, more and more books, more and more retreats, more and more confusion. What, why is this difference? Difference in preparation of the mind. Then the next note is, Dhirishanji says, there are four kinds of minds. So here it gets a slightly insulting. One is the rock-like mind. You try to drive a nail into it, the nail breaks. So drive Vedantic teachings into this mind. Remember, these are four kinds of minds of seekers. They want, want to learn Vedanta. So rock like mind, nothing gets in. They want to listen, but what did you get? I don't know. Um, Swami Ranganathanji, uh, of revered memory, he was the 13th president of our order. When he was the head of the ashram in New Delhi, so huge crowds used to come. And one Punjabi lady, she used to sit in the front, very um, simple kind of person. But every day she would come and sit in the front and listen intently and then go. So Ranganathanji made the mistake of asking her one day. Uh, and actually, she came and did pranams. Bahut badiya Mahatma ji, uh, Swamiji, bahut badiya, wonderful Swamiji. Ranganathanji made the mistake of asking her, so what did you like in the talk? And she said, I'll tell you in Hindi and then translate. Hum kya jane, Mahatma ji? Badi badi Vedant ke baat hum kya samjhe? <laughs> What do I know? They all big talk, Vedantic talk, but it whatever it was is good. <laughs> Rock like intellect. Nothing penetrates. It sounds nice, but I don't get it. What are you trying to say? I was talking to um, this person. Uh, we talked about Vedanta that you're not the body, not the mind, or the witness consciousness. She she listened with intently, and then finally. She said, Haan to? So? <laughs> you are Brahman, you are limitless existence, consciousness, bliss, Chidananda, Rupa, Shivoham, Shankaracharya sings, I am pure consciousness, nature of Shiva. So? <laughs> Rock like. But what can be done, he will tell later on. But then better than this, he says, is the rubber like intellect. So like a rubber sheet, you push in a needle, it will go in, but it will bounce out again, it will be expelled again. So the mind is so full of worldliness and worldly cares and concerns. It's not that this person doesn't understand, but can't retain anything. It's gone. And so many people complain. It's very clear here, but when I leave and go back, it's all gone. Until the next time I come back and listen. <laughs> so the mind expels the teaching. Then the third kind of um, uh, intellect, he says, even better than this, 
is the skin like intellect when you push in a needle it will stay there so exactly the kind of instruction that is given will be heard understood retained and some effort will go into practicing it in life that's better and then he says the best kind of intellect is like a drop of oil on the surface of water immediately it spreads over the surface of water similarly even the little bit of intellect that person understands and understands all the implications retains it works it out and transforms it into life swami prabhavananda ji who was uh, the founder of our vedanta society in southern california in, in hollywood he tells of the time when he was a young monk and that ashram swami turiyanandi ji had come he was staying there turiyanandi ji was a disciple of sri ramakrishna great vedanta an enlightened person jeevan mukta so prabhavan ji said i thought let me not waste this opportunity let me study gita from swami turiyanand what a great opportunity so he went to turiyanand ji turiyanand ji kept refusing prabhavan ji would not let go and turiyanand ji finally said come tomorrow with the gita so next day in the morning he turned up with the gita and swami turiyanand said take up one verse memorize it think well upon it try to practice it in your life on one week then take up the next verse this is my first and last lesson in gita to you he himself used to do that turiyanand ji has mentioned in another place how he spent his time in rishikesh in tap in tapasya in austerity months and years he would spend in a little grass hut in padnakutir made of um, you know branches and leaves and all. he would one once in a day he would go for begging for food whatever rough fare he got whole day day time would go in study he would take up one verse of the upanishads or the bhagavad gita memorize it and dwell upon it try to practice it and dwell upon it for a week and then take up another one like this and then at night he was deep his uh, reminiscences it's so inspiring difficult also of course he says at night so day would pass like that and night after sunset whole night would pass in meditation he didn't need to sleep at one time he went 6 days without sleep and he got scared on the sev- on the seventh day uh, he no five days on saturday he uh, tried to sleep he practiced sleeping and he got half an hour of sleep and he was delighted <laughs> it's the opposite for us we try to meditate and fall asleep immediately he is meditating so much that he can't fall asleep so that is the oil like into the drop of oil on a surface of water that kind of intellect best now suppose is there no hope if my mind is not ready if i have a rock like intellect is there no hope for me so multiplicity of practices are there one is um, masses of japa mantra japa this is something i've seen sadhus prescribe do masses thousands and thousands of japa morning and evening it purifies the mind and makes it sattvic um then whatever works regular ritualistic worship go to the garden pluck flowers decorate the shrine um clean the place put on a clean take a bath put on clean clothes sit there there's a whole ritual associated with it by itself it's not very spiritual but it elevates the mind makes the mind sattvic and then do the ritualistic worship even for a short time 15 minutes 30 minutes 45 minutes do it physically physically offer the things for that you have to make preparations chant the mantras and so on and you would go down even more to the physical level yoga asana asana is in physical regular yoga asana pranayama all those things catch hold of the body itself the body is made harmonious and healthy the mind benefits immediately so these are many many ways of uh, reconditioning the mind the mind has been damaged and disturbed no fault of the mind we have done it ourselves so reconditioning purifying the mind making it more sattvic number 13 i am going to verse number 13 ಸರ್ವಾಪ್ಯಕಲಾಜಂತೋರ್ಕಸರ್ವಾಪ್ಯಕಲಾಜಂತೋರ್ನಭ್ಯಾಸೇನಶ್ಯತಿ so all knowledge is destroyed by not practicing so practicing brings develops protects and uh, you know 
increases knowledge, any, any skill, knowledge. But this knowledge, enlightenment, once you make a breakthrough, it's there. You don't have to practice it anymore. You can. You can and you should, but it will never go away. That, that he gives us a clue. This is not some kind of intellectual knowledge. This What we are doing now is intellectual. But what will come when we make the breakthrough, when we realize what we are, after all, you are pure consciousness. That is not dependent on what whether you know or you do not know, whether you believe it or not believe it, whether you accept it or you don't accept it. Uh, one sadhu in Uttarakhand used to tell us again and again, tum jano ya na jano, tum mano ya na mano, tum hi Ram. Whether you know it or not, whether you accept it or not, you are Rama. I mean, you are one with God. So once that breakthrough is there, it will always remain. So this is a point which has to be cleared up. Otherwise, people might think, all oh, this is nice. I'm beginning to get it a little bit, but it's so subtle and difficult, it's lost immediately. This, this kind of knowledge is not very useful because it will go away at the first sign of trouble. It will, but there is a breakthrough which comes, which will never go away. And not only that, it will become deeper and deeper uh, as we go through life by itself. If you cultivate it much faster, if you don't cultivate it by itself, it will keep becoming deeper. Swami Vivekananda said, truth is a substance of, as truth is a corrosive substance of infinite power. Once it falls upon you, it will work its way through. So even the teaching, what we are hearing, this is not enlightenment, this is Shravana which is going on. This is very valuable. See, in any other practice, if you listen to a talk, if you listen, read a book, in yoga, for example, meditation, reading the book is not yoga. You will actually have to lead a moral life, then sit, sit in an asana, control the breath, withdraw from the world, and practice the attention, the focusing. That is meditation, not the lecture or the book. But in Vedanta, the study of this and listening to the talk, you're already on your way. Congratulations. You're already practicing Advaita Vedanta. Shravana. Shravana is already practice of Advaita Vedanta. Manana is already practice of Advaita Vedanta. In fact, this is called Antaranga. The inner practices, outer circle of practice, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, dhyana yoga. Inner circle of practice, very close to the goal. Inner circle of practice is hearing, reflecting, meditation. Then, number 14. Swakanthe pishtitam vastu. Swakanthe pishtitam vastu. Yathana prapyate brahmat. Yathana prapyate brahmat, brahmante prapyate tadvad, brahmante prapyate tadvad, atma pi guru vakyataha, atma pi guru vakyataha. So something like a jewel or an ornament on the neck is believed to have been lost due to forgetfulness and seems to have been regained when the mistaken belief is gone. Similarly, the ever attained atman though it seems to be unattained due to ignorance, appears to be regained as it were, the removal of ignorance due to the instructions received from the Guru. Anyway, all of this is summed up nicely in a phrase which the monks use in Hindi, in, uh, in the Himalayas. What does Vedanta do? Praptasya prapti nivrittasya nivritti. What does Vedanta do? It gives you what you already have. And it takes away what was never there. Gives you what you already have and takes away what was never there. I read... In the old wild west, a man was, uh, what do you call, snake oil salesman. Man was hauled up before the magistrate, before the sheriff, uh, before the judge. The sheriff hauled up the man before the judge. The man was charged with selling real, co uh, real cures for imaginary diseases and imaginary cures for real diseases. That reminds me, just recently somebody uh, was um, proposing that we should use AI for our Vedanta. I asked a computer science expert and he gave a cautionary note. He said, at this point, Swami, AI is more like, with a, is like a solution searching for a problem. <laughs> yes. Don't be in a hurry. You can use it for some things, but don't replace the Swami with AI as yet. <laughs> And they demonstrated to me. A PhD student from the University of Texas, UT Austin, demonstrated a, a computer science project they have. It's called Sarva Priyananda AI. <laughs> they have fed the AI with 
1000 hours of video talks by me and given it access to the whole internet and then if you ask questions so it was based and uh, it will give answers based on vedanta questions will give answers based on all, all that material and i saw the demonstration it gives better answers than me i have to, I have to <laughs> admit because all of what i have said and studied is not immediately available to my mind but ai got, got access to all that and the beauty of it also is it gives you sources it will give you the answer and say where did sarvapriyananda say this look at this video at this minute he said it like that plus it will say stuff which i don't know because it has got access to the whole internet so generally advaita vedanta indian philosophy western philosophy modern science you know everything it draws upon and gives you a nice answer but sometimes it hallucinates that's the problem <laughs> no really those who do work on ai they know it's a real problem ai hallucinates it will give you a very nice answer if it had no meaning at all and totally false <laughs> very sincerely it will tell you that but it's not anyway so that's there praptasya prapti nivrittasya nivritti this is an important thing to understand in advaita vedanta what is it that we are trying to achieve is it like that snake oil salesman <laughs> you know somebody says management consultants what do they do they look at your watch and tell you the time <laughs> with apologies to management consultants <laughs> so is advaita vedanta like that um so praptasya prapti you are brahman what you attain is what you already are but you thought you were not um so the classical example they use is gala valaya praptivat like a necklace on the neck which a person has forgotten and searching everywhere for it we do it with glasses uh, or mobile phone in the pocket we're searching everywhere for it so uh, it's already attained but somehow we're convinced it's not attained and then we really work hard to get it so when you become enlightened what will be your feeling you will realize it was always there how did i not see it it was always always all right why was i so upset so it is fine it was fine is fine will always be fine but you have to know it otherwise you can't stop being upset you can believe me swami said book said i am all right but i feel so many problems are there praptasya prapti what is there you will get it nivrittasya nivritti what was not there will will be removed all the problems of samsara the problem of death and sorrow and illness and limitation and frustration and lack of fulfillment all these problems you suddenly realize you the witness consciousness had none of these problems actually never had and you'll be huge load of your mind you'll realize oh it's all right i am perfectly fine so are all these people they just don't don't know it so he says attainment is of two kinds one is gala valaya prapti getting a necklace which you have forgotten it's on your neck that's one kind that's vedanta the other kind is grama de desha prapti going to the next village that kind of attainment requires work you have to do something to get it and Un- actually unattained something so in spiritual life there are things which are actually unattained for example samadhi the complete absorption in the mind it's actually unattained and if i do meditation over a long period of time i will be able to attain it mystical experience visions of god is actually unattained and if i work at it for a long time assiduously i might be lucky enough to get some visions of god some kind of mystical experience those things are attainable by effort this one is attained by knowledge only because knowledge will show you it was always there then renunciation getting rid of the problem is of two kinds one is actually physically you have to get rid of things you are in uh, they give the example of tiger chasing not really a problem in pittsburgh but um, you know sometimes you might get sudden cold weather you have to be ready for it you have to get rid of the problem by heating and all of that so that uh, so it happened in central park there was flooding in new york and there's a zoo there in central park and the sea lion escaped from the zoo because the cage was the pool was flooded so it floated out and went away and they, they were all worried wait so in the, suddenly in the park a sea lion is walk, walking around but it walked around a little i mean it waddled around a little bit here and there and then it was bored came back to the pool by itself so there's one kind of renunciation getting rid of trouble which is actually there other kind of renunciation is it's not there by by mistake i thought it was there so samsara is like that always remember 
what spiritual life can do and cannot do. That story of the Buddha. A monk went to the Buddha and said, I have a question. This is, and this is from the earliest sources, so it's pro probably a real story of the Buddha, and not um, social media, WhatsApp story. Mm -hmm. So the monk asked the Buddha, I have a question. The Buddha said, what question? You said that there is sorrow in life. That's the problem. And sorrow is, you know, the Buddha's story, old age, disease, death, uh, jara, uh, jara, roga, mrityu, old age, disease, death. These are the things that the Buddha had seen. Yes. And you said there is a way out of this sorrow. Nirvana, freedom from the sorrow. Yes. And you have found it and you are teaching us. Yes. What is the question? The question is, then we are practicing it. But we are getting old. Many of us are getting sick. Some of us have died. You are also getting old. You also get sick sometimes. And so unfortunately, we are sure you will die one day. So how did you overcome uh, sorrow? The old age, disease, death are still there. Is this the question? And the Buddha's answer, a simple question, but a profound question, and we should get it clear, otherwise there will be a problem in spiritual life. Buddha's answer is crystal clear. Vivekananda used to say about the Buddha. is a man, the most, most perfectly sane man in the world. No cobwebs in that brain. His answer was, sorrow is of two kinds. It's like a man hit by two arrows. The first arrow is what the world throws at you old age, disease, death, and all sorts of problems, real and perceived, whatever it is. And the second one is your reaction to the first arrow. The man, how he reacts to the first arrow. That's the second arrow. How do we react to what has happened to us? We react with sorrow. We react with rage, rejection, trauma, suffering. So our reaction accounts for the bulk of our suffering. Not so much what the world does to us. And the proof of this is two people react to the same problem in two different ways. Every doctor knows this. Every doctor, he or, he or she, you have seen uh, patients with utmost serious problems, taking it with calm dignity. You have seen patients with minor problems, uh, breaking down and making a big fuss over it. That means it's not the problem itself which causes the maximum suffering. Pain will be there. They say the saying, pain will be there. Suffering is optional. The second arrow is what causes the bulk of our suffering. And the Buddha said, what I teach you will take away the suffering from the second arrow. About the first one, I cannot do anything. First one, we have to deal with it with worldly means, with medicine, with science, with law and order, whatever things we have in this civilization are all for dealing with the first arrow. Spirituality is for dealing with the second arrow. And maximum suffering is caused by the second arrow. If you can deal with that second arrow, any problem with the first arrow also we are ready to face. And the first arrow cannot be totally avoided at all. You can mitigate it. It cannot be totally avoided. It comes from our past karma. It cannot be avoided so much. Okay. So uh, we will wrap up now. And then we will, right? Um, second session, the same. Is it 3.30? Uh, Oh, from uh, oh really? Oh, one session. I see. Oh, good, good, good. I I, I was a little confused. One thirty to three. Good. We can stay longer. Uh, we can stay longer. <laughs> I think. They... All right. Now I'm going to go into some very serious stuff. You will uh, have to pay attention here for the next half an hour. Is one thirty to three or one thirty two? One thirty to three. Okay. Now. Let me go into do we have um, some time afterwards after three is there please, please uh, ask the organizers uh, when do we have to leave the um, hall so you just find out let me know so we can go on a little more after that after three yeah good so that we'll do this then we'll have Q&A after that. This way we need a little more time. And let us know when we have to cut it off. I'm going to go to the end of the chapter. Very important verse that we will do now. Try to understand the teaching at its depth and also get a little taste of it. 
what is the verse first we will chant and then try to understand verse number 25 verse number 25 Sarvam ekam idam shantam Sarvam ekam idam shantam Adi madhyanta varjitam Adi madhyanta varjitam Bhava bhava vinir muktam Bhava bhava vinir muktam Iti gyatva sukhi bhava Iti gyatva sukhi bhava. This visible universe is without any beginning, middle or end. It is beyond existence or non-existence. It is tranquil. It is nothing but the non-dual Brahman. Knowing thus, be happy. This is actually stunning. We can understand to some extent, if you say you're not the body mind, you're the witness consciousness, sakshi, to some extent we can get it. But this which we are experiencing right now here, this is limitless consciousness and nothing else. How? This seems to be completely contradictory to our experience. Let us see how, how counterintuitive this verse is and how stunningly important it is. We will see now. And we'll try to understand it actually at the end of this process. We will even get a taste of it, what he's trying to say. Saravam mekam idam shantam. Idam, the word idam means this, this, here, what we are seeing here, what we are you know, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, what we are thinking, experiencing, enjoying, suffering, this. He says, Sarvam, all of this ekam, it's one. We go, no, it isn't. It's many. There are so many people here. And each person is sitting on a chair which is different from him. The chair is sitting on the ground which is different from the chair and the person. This world is full of diversity. How can it be one? It isn't one. He says, Sarvam Ekam. It might be there is some one Brahman, one God, something like that. Idam, this one, this one, here. Sarvam Ekam. Idam Sarvam Ekam. It's one reality. Then more madness is to come. Shantam. Idam Sarvam Shantam. It is completely tranquil Brahman. Existence, consciousness, bliss. No samsara. No trouble. No misery. No illness. No death. No war. No uh, suicide. Uh, no um, poverty. No frustration. No depression. No old age, disease, death like uh, Buddha was fighting against. Uh, shantam. Prapanchopashama, the entire universe. This, this, is the, this is the silence of the universe. This is the language of Pandukya Upanishad. Prapanchopashamam shantam. It is peace itself. What is peace? Right now, the technique we said, we stop talking to yourself, listen to the sound of peace. Okay, that is, I understand. It was a little peaceful for a while. No, when the mind is talking, when this world is going on, when war is going on, when upsets are there externally at a macro level, my life is not going too well at the micro level, all of this, he says, shantam. This is absolute serenity and peace and tranquility. It is the highest divinity right now, here. There, idam, idam, here, now. Then even further, Adi Madhyanta Vajjitam. There is no birth, no existence, no death. No production, no existence, no ceasing, no cessation, no destruction. Of what? Idam. This. We don't understand this. We think, yes, if you talk about, about God, yeah, there's something called God or Atman Brahman, which was never born, which always is there, will never cease. All those things, ideas, I can understand. But here in this world, it's completely contrary to our, ex our experience. People are born. I have been born. You think there's no birth? No. Adi, there's no beginning. And there is, well, people are born. They grow up. They grow, um, become adults. They grow old and they die. He says, there is no beginning. There's no growing up, becoming an adult, no existing like that and no dying either. Adi Madhya Anta Vajjitam. Devoid of beginning, devoid of middle, devoid of end. 
What? Idam, idam, this one. But it is just contrary to what we see across this universe, from the microscopic to the macroscopic, from tiniest particles to vast galaxies, are all born, all have a middle existence, and all have an end. And he says, nothing has a beginning, nothing has a middle, nothing has an end. Where? Here. Idam, idam. Bhava, bhava, minir muktam. Bhava means existing things. People, chairs and tables, birds and uh, animals, trees, the sky and the earth, planets, uh, quarks and quasars, these are existing things. Bhava. Abhava means absence. This is a philosophical concept. Absence means something is not there. Here is the mo mobile on the table. This is the presence of the mobile on the table. It's a bhava padartha, existing entity. Now I remove it. There's an absence of the mobile on the table. It's abhava padartha, absence. This is, this is from Nyaya philosophy. There is no bhava, no abhava, he says. Bhava, bhava, binir muktam. This is what our world is full of. Things which are there and things which are not there. And how can it be full of things which are not there? Yesterday, day for yesterday, I went to a walk in a cemetery nearby. Very beautiful. It's full of people who are not there. <laughs> this is abhava. But it's, you, you feel their presence. The loved ones, they feel their, the presence of the absence. I remember there was a very beloved Swami, Swami Lokeshwarananda in our order. I have seen him when I was young. So he was the head of our Institute of Culture in Calcutta. After he passed, there was a meeting. Uh, professor Larson from the United States, he was a great professor of Indian philosophy. Sankhya's was his specialty. He went to give a talk. He was very close to the Swami. So in his talk, I still remember, the professor stood up and said, today we are acutely conscious of the presence of the absence of Swami Lokeshwarananda. <laughs> True. And somebody very beloved, somebody very impressive, but no longer here am, am, uh, amidst us. You feel the absence of something. There was something here which is absent now. So, bhava, bhava. I remember once I studied Navyanaya, the school of uh, ancient school, uh, medieval school of neologic, Navyanaya school. And the subject of that course was, I did a 15-day advanced course, five hours a day, 15 days on um, neologic, the Indian school of neologic, Navyanaya. And the subject was nothing, <laughs> absence, abhava, nothing. So five hours a day for 15 days, we talked about nothing, very seriously. <laughs> and the example he used was that there is no pot on the ta table. That's a classic. That's just a sentence. Bhutale ghato nasti. On the surface, there's no table. And there's no pot. Surface means he meant basically a table. So there is a, there's no pot. There's no pot on the table. And that sentence was analyzed five hours a day for 15, 15 days. And I remember there was a caretaker in that hall. It was in the Asiatic Society in Calcutta. There was a caretaker who looked after the facilities. He would switch on the light, put on the, you know, clean the blackboard and everything. So he would listen to this. And then one day he came up to me. I think he was the only monk, so he felt comfortable coming up. Everybody else was a professor or a grad student, things like that. So he came up to me and said, you really want a pot? I can get one for you. It's very easy. <laughs> he felt bad. You know, he's in, he is responsible for this facility, this hall. And there's, these people are cribbing every day. There's no pot on the table. And incessantly, they go on and on and on. I said, I can get it. It's just very cheap. It's, it's available right there. I can get it for you if you want a pot on the table. <laughs> bhava, bhava, vinir muktam. This entire universe, all of this idam here, it is devoid of any existing thing. Oh, so everything is absent. It's devoid of all absent things also. There is no existence. There's no absence. There's no presence, no absence. Where? Idam. Here, this universe. What is this? Iti gaptwa, know this and be happy. Sukhi bhava. What does this mean? What does this mean? So, this is a profound, very profound statement. And we will understand it by the end of this analysis. We'll understand it, maybe even taste it a little bit. Note, we'll start with an example. This is something I'm, I'm pulling from Aparokshanubhuti. There's a verse there. Karye hi karanam pashyet, tato karyam visarjayet, 
कारणत्वं ततो गच्छेत अवशिष्टं भवेद मुनि ही सी द कॉज द मटेरियल कॉज इन द इफेक्ट देन लेट गो ऑफ द इफेक्ट द कॉजैलिटी ऑफ द कॉज इज लॉस्ट व्हाट रिमेन्स इज यू द एनलाइटेंड सेज व्हाट डज इट मीन इट वर्क्स लाइक दिस लेट्स टेक आवर पॉट व्हिच इज एब्सेंट बट एनीवे द पॉट क्ले पॉट This is example Shankaracharya takes a common example, clay pot. Now we have a pot, and I have many complaints about it, anxieties about it. It can break. Other pots are better than it, better than better than my pot. Uh, and I wish I hadn't bought this pot. Buyers regret, you know, that other pot would have been better. But anyway, it was Black Friday. Amazon deal was there, so I bought this pot. What to do? I'm now stuck with this pot. For pot, read anything. Car, spouse, children, whatever it is, <laughs> job, <laughs> gadgets, the pot. Now somebody comes and introduces, and this pot will break. I'm afraid of that. It'll go one day. So somebody comes and introduces me to say there is something here in this pot which will not break, which will never be lost. No. It doesn't depend on the pot. It was there before the pot was there, and it will be there after the pot is gone. It is there when the pot is there. Wow. Immortal, huh? Yes. What is that? It's called clay. It's called clay. It's there in this pot. So this is something called clay. And not only that, um, all the pots are clay. The ones you have, and the other ones, there's no difference. Wow. So this clay it sounds really good and sounds much better than my pot. Where is this clay? It's there in the pot. कार्यी ही कारणम पश्येत लुक फॉर द कॉज मटेरियल कॉज इन द इफेक्ट इफेक्ट इज पॉट कॉज मींस द मटेरियल आउट ऑफ व्हिच द पॉट इज मेड व्हाट इज द मटेरियल आउट ऑफ व्हिच अ क्ले पॉट इज मेड ट्रिक क्वेश्चन है आंसर इज देयर क्ले सो द क्ले लुक फॉर द क्ले इन द क्ले पॉट वी कैन इजीली डू दैट वी आर एक्सपर्ट्स एट इट आई सी या आई सी इट टॉप ऑफ द पॉट इज क्ले मिडिल ऑफ द पॉट इज क्ले बॉटम ऑफ द पॉट इज क्ले इनसाइड ऑफ द पॉट इज क्ले आउटसाइड इज क्ले इन फैक्ट इट्स थ्रू एंड थ्रू क्ले tato karyam visarjayet let go of the effect how do you let go what is the effect pot let go of the effect means you see that the pot is nothing but clay there is no entity called pot apart from the clay what is the pot then it's a name it's a form and it's a use you can put water in it and it looks round like that i mean you call it a pot it's got some designs on it and stuff like that So one might say, "Yeah, but wait, wait a minute. There are two. I, I admit, uh, there is something called clay, but there is something called pot. No, there isn't. This we have to drive it into our heads. It's very important. There isn't. Apart from the clay, neither the shape of the pot will exist, nor the use of the pot can be done, nor the name will refer to anything. If you take the clay away, what will the name do? It'll float in the air. Where will be the shape of the pot if you take the clay away? Nowhere." Where will the water be? If you take the clay away, it will be a mess. <laughs> water will spill out. So use a name and form, which is Maya. The name, form, and use, Nama, Rupa, Vivahar in Sanskrit, depends entirely on the material cause, the clay. Okay. Then what? Then next, if the clay is the only thing that exists, there is no real second entity called a pot. If the cause is the only thing that exists, there is no real F. effect then what follow this question what is the cause a cause of cause and effect material and a product if the product is not there what is this a cause of what did it produce nothing it was clay earlier and now after the pot what is it clay where is the pot apart from the clay so it is only clay the cause alone remains but then it has not produced anything therefore the causality of the cause is lost karanatvam tato gachet what is left then finally at the end of this analysis only clay but shankaracharya says only you are left now what does this mean let's see now he will we will go into this analysis to understand this verse and then also experience please match with our own experience whatever you are seeing now you are aware right you are seeing now a book you are aware you are seeing now this cloth you are aware cloth is different from the book clearly you can see but is that awareness different isn't it the same awareness to which the book was revealed it isn't it the, literally the same awareness to which the cloth was the cloth was revealed uh, your eyes changed focus 
your mind thought differently different data came in but the awareness which you experienced you the awareness are you not the same awareness isn't it the same light reflecting of the cloth uh, of the book of the cloth of the mobile yes so the awareness remains the same no matter what we see then very different from seeing is hearing you're hearing my voice hearing music hearing sound hearing silence but isn't it the same awareness whatever you hear is the same awareness whatever you see whatever you hear behind both is the same awareness seeing and hearing are very different experiences awareness is there in fact whatever we smell taste touch as well as see and hear it is constantly the same awareness throughout our days and not only that when you look inwards thoughts memories likes and dislikes pleasure and pain all of them are enabled illumined made possible by the same awareness you see something and you think about it the same awareness illumined the seeing illumined the thinking whatever we do talking walking sitting all of those are experienced in awareness kadye hi karanam pashyet in the effect find see the inherent cause the material out of which this what is the effect here our lives our lives is the effect we have many problems in our lives now just like the clay was introduced to you when you are holding the pot now vedanta comes and introduces the clay consciousness you worried about old age yeah you worried about death yeah i don't want to think about it and worried about many problems in life yes would you like to know there is something in you in your life which will not die really something that will not get old something that will not be affected by physical problems mental problems really what is that that is called not clay consciousness <laughs> <laughs> that is there in all that you see hear smell taste touch that is there in all that we think remember desire that we hate that we love that we uh, remember that we feel emotion it is there in all pleasure it is there in all pain everywhere it is there same consciousness not only that it is there throughout our waking that's why the waking experience is possible but when we fall asleep and this world disappears our body also disappears from my experience and a world of dream comes up in the dreams also the whole thing is made possible because of the same consciousness all the bhavas the things which come and go because of the same consciousness i am able to experience those things and then deep sleep when the mind shuts down no waking no dreaming blank that also is made possible because it's illumined by consciousness this is a little more subtle to understand but it's it's worth thinking about the absence of something it's like this you are seeing me now right no <laughs> and then you close your eyes Uh, you are not seeing me anymore so there is an absence of seeing but had you become absent you the awareness you are there you illumine the seeing now you illumine the not seeing similarly imagine shutting down all senses and all internal thinking and feeling you will still be there but not blank nothing will be experienced even i am sleeping that also won't be experienced because mind has shut down so this one consciousness pervades our waking dreaming deep sleep it pervades our days weeks months years then we notice that this everything changes this consciousness does not change everything appears to it and disappears to it and notice if you do not you the consciousness do not depend upon you seeing me you are seeing me you are there consciousness if you don't see me close your eyes you can't see me but have you gone just because you can't see me you are still there right so the whole of worldly experience depends on consciousness but consciousness does not depend for its existence on that worldly experience let me repeat that all the experience of our life what we call life yeah. family life personal life professional life yeah. painful life enjoyable life youth middle age old age all that waking dreaming sleep all that depends on you the consciousness but consciousness does not depend on that 
It's like you are conscious and you are seeing me. If you close your eyes, you're not seeing me, but you're still there conscious. But now let me ask you, if you, that consciousness were not there, would seeing be there still? Are you understanding the question? I'm aware, I can see you. I can't see you, but I'm still aware. But that awareness, if it was not there, would that seeing happen even if the eyes were open? No. Would you be able to hear, smell, taste, touch, walk, talk, think, enjoy, suffer? Nothing. Nothing. It is the clay of the pot of life. And as we examined the pot and found every bit of it was clay. In fact, the pot is nothing but clay. Similarly, as we examine all our experiences, we find every bit in and through everything there is consciousness. And without consciousness, just like without clay, no pot. Without consciousness, no life. No experience of life. Consciousness is the material out of which the experience of life comes. It's a trick statement, tautology, because experience, I have already mentioned, consciousness plus object is equal to experience. So experience, which we call life, is basically you, the awareness, plus various objects coming up in you, the awareness. So the material of experience is consciousness. But somebody might say, no, 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 it's not just consciousness. Consciousness plus object. Then only experience is there. But note, just like you say pot, clay plus pot is what we are seeing together. But no, that pot by itself does not exist apart from the clay. Similarly, those objects which we call objects, which we are experiencing, a variety, is there any possibility of proving the existence of those objects apart from consciousness? I'm not saying your consciousness or my consciousness. Apart from the very possibility of experience, there's no possibility of proving any, any object. Objects are those which appear in consciousness. The philosopher Arindam Chakravarti brilliantly defined He's very good with this <laughs> wordplay. So very brilliantly and profoundly define object. What is an object? An object is anything that objects to my consciousness. <laughs> an object is anything that objects. To... Imagine your consciousness like a field which is spreading out. And then it runs up against objects. Sight, form, sound, smell, taste, touch. These are objects. Your consciousness is running into them and giving you experiences. Like water spreading out, hits a rock and then splashes there. Similarly experience. But we are going further. Those objects cannot be demonstrated, cannot be proved without consciousness. They are appearances in consciousness. Just like pot is an appearance of clay. A name, form and function given to clay. This world of objects is name, form and function given to consciousness. And the name, form, and function have no existence of their own. That name, form, and function is called Maya, Nama Rupa Vyavahara. Now, now you will see the meaning of the verse. Kāyehi Karanam Pashyet. Look in the in the product that is our experience of life, and in that, in every experience, see consciousness. I am the consciousness shining in every experience. Whether I hear, smell, taste, touch, see, whether I'm waking, dreaming, sleeping, whether I'm enjoying or suffering, understanding, not understanding, remembering, forgetting, all those experiences, they shine in consciousness. Tato karyam visarjayat. Let go of the effect. The experiences, see that it is only consciousness because all the experiences are all pervaded by consciousness. Karanatvam tato gachet. In that case, the causality of consciousness is lost. Clay alone exists. It appears to be a pot, but clay alone exists. Consciousness alone exists. It appears to be life. Who is that consciousness? It's you. You and only you. No, no, Swami, I'll, we are all intruded. Be inclusive. No, you and only you. All of us are appearing to you in that consciousness only. Not apart from that consciousness. There's only one consciousness. It is you, but it's equally each of us. This one consciousness. Then what happens? Avashishtam bhavet munihi. The enlightened one alone is left. Now we understand the meaning. I, the consciousness alone, am left. Even while experiencing this world. Even while experiencing this world. Now see the benefit of this. See the benefit of this. You are beyond death. 
body is born it ages it becomes uh, middle aged old and dies you the consciousness you experience the baby's body the child's body the youth's body middle aged body old uh, decrepit body dead body not just once again and again and again we are past masters at dying is there's one thing that we need not be afraid of it's dying you've seen the death of the body many times we are, we suffer because we think we have the body it's a pot which gets broken that's why we think we are afraid of the pot which is broken another example i love is the wave and the water the story of the little wave so little wave is born out there in the ocean uh, what's there the closest is atlantic yes it is atlantic out there in the atlantic a little wave is born and then it sees looks around itself and sees uh, other little waves and makes wave friends and goes to wave school and has a lot of fun but slowly problems appear in every uh, kids life problems appear little problems but wave like problems so some waves are very big and it's very it has gets an inferiority complex i'll never be like that oh my god and some waves are even smaller there are there are bubbles and stuff and the little wave is full of contempt for them what a loser mm. and then some waves are friendly to it and other waves are mean to it and so on so all sorts of problems are there and the wave goes on becoming bigger and bigger then it sees in the distance what's going on there oh that's the united states of america what happens so in this atlantic shore all waves go to die there <laughs> oh what yes did the waves go and get smashed on the rocks and that's it gone you'll be burst into a million pieces of spray and you know water droplets me too yes everybody all of us oh my god it gets depressed then a vedantic wave comes along <laughs> so don't worry and don't worry there is something called water in you which will not die really uh, it will not die and where will i find this water you search yourself go first deep into yourself when he you begins to understand what water is you will find deep inside yourself there is water on your surface there is water in the middle there is water around you there is water <laughs> below you there is water it's water all around oh i realize and this wave will go and hit the shore water will continue wave form will be lost will be millions of droplets of water so water will continue even if you are evaporated go up into the clouds you will come down on the earth as blessing uh, water will continue not only that you realize all the other waves are water only they are all the same as me as water where is my limitation am i only the water in this wave the moment i identify myself as water where is the boundary between this wave and the next wave no boundary the boundary is also water suddenly i become the ocean i am all of it and the biggest wave the tiniest wave they are all me there is no need for infinity complex there is no need for uh, contempt there is no need for fear of death all are one with me i am one with all i am in all all waves are in me sarva bhuteshu chatmanam sarva bhutani chatmani i the atman pure consciousness in all beings and all beings in me the pure consciousness when now 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 when is the wave water when is the wave water all the time now yes when are you consciousness all the time now yes there was consciousness plus body the body problem still remains <laughs> no if you are consciousness then you are not consciousness plus body body is also nothing but consciousness it's an appearance in consciousness the problems of the body body appearance will continue as appearance problems but in reality it remains consciousness so will it not die consciousness will not die body will die hatred jealousy no whom will you be we have hatred for they are all nothing but you the consciousness all beings are you you are in all beings so this is the uh, the teaching now let us quickly look at the first now it will make sense sarvam ekam idam shantam please repeat sarvam ekam idam shantam adi madhyanta varjitam adi madhyanta varjitam bhava bhava vinirmukta 
ंडरस्टैंडिंग whether you are doing art or science or nothing all of that is one homogeneous consciousness at this point rock intellect will say so <laughs> you are that when you are that you can't say so anymore i'm talking about you you are that one consciousness the entirety of the universe is the sarvam ekam idam idam sarvam ekam it's all one consciousness you know tsunami wave little wave is it right to say it is all one water true no doubt about it variety of shapes and um, colors of pots all made from one lump of clay is it not the same thing it's the same thing it is the same consciousness no matter what you experience whoever it is whatever it is it is you the consciousness sarvam ekam not only that shantam just as birth and death is not there in water wave is born and wave dies but birth and death is not there in water contempt and superiority and um, rivalry is there between the little waves but not there as water it's all the same similarly all sorrows all samsara problems shantam when forever in the midst of poverty in the midst of ill health in the midst of uh, loneliness in the midst of struggle in life tensions throughout the day shantam as consciousness take a look one sadhu used to say so beautifully din mein ek baar dekh leo mahatma ji vastu kaisi hai <laughs> take a look once in a day at least oh oh monk take a look at least once in a day take a look at the reality take a look at yourself how will i take a look mirror this book mirror Up- vedanta is the mirror take a look at yourself sarvam ekam idam shantam where is the problem in the world any number of problems never will be solved you can make it with hard work you can make it little better for a while it will again deteriorate guaranteed <laughs> but as far as you are concerned you are perfectly all right being perfectly all right you work for improving the pot give it a little new coat of paint and mend the cracks fine but you know yourself to be the clay adi madhyanta vajjitam in consciousness yes in the body there is birth there is youth there is teenage there is middle age old age death in in uh, consciousness is there birth is consciousness born is consciousness middle aged is consciousness getting overweight does consciousness have diabetes no impossible ridiculous you are laughing yes you should laugh at the same time body will get all that The same Swami Turiyananda, when he was a youngster, he goes to Sri Ramakrishna, who was dying of throat cancer, and asks him, "Sir, how are you today?" Sri Ramakrishna says, "Oh, it hurts. I cannot eat." And Turiyananda ji was Hari. His name was Hari. He says, "Sir, I see that you are uh, in great bliss." It's a cruel thing to say to a ca- terminal cancer patient, but Sri Ramakrishna accepts it. He laughs and he says, "Oh, the rascal has found me out." Shala Dhoreniyas in in Bengali he said, "The rascal has found me out." He and has understood. How can the same bliss is possible for each one of us? It's readily available to each one of us in the midst of our problems. See yourself as this consciousness, which is neither an effect nor a cause. Karya karana vilakshana atma, panchakosha vilakshana atma, avasthatraya sakshi atma. the consciousness you the consciousness beyond cause and effect you the consciousness uh, distinct from the five koshas five koshas the five layers of the him somebody told me a nice joke as which a swami told a uh, the rabbi what is the joke rabbi the atma vedanta atma is not kosher <laughs> 
No, I have a rabbi visiting next week. I'll tell him the joke. <laughs> Pancha Kosha Vilakshana Atma. The witness of the five koshas. That's kosha, not kosher. <laughs> kosha means the sheets, body, cell, uh, prana, mind, and all that. Pancha Kosha. Uh, Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vigyanamaya, Anandamaya. Avastatraya, Sakshi Atma, witness of the waking, dreaming, deep sleep. You, the consciousness. Are you not the witness, the experiencer of your waking, dreaming? Who else is? That consciousness we are talking about right here, right now. Bhava, Bhava, Vinir Mukta. There is no pot in the clay, even when you are actually holding the pot and using it. Where is the, this is a Buddhist uh, argument. Chandrakirti is called Chandrakirti's chariot. Chandrakirti says, where is the chariot? Are the parts of the chariot the chariot? No. Is it something apart from the parts of the chariot? No. Is it in the parts of the chariot like the water is in the bottle? Like that, is there a parts and in that there is one chariot? No. Are the parts of the chariot in the chariot? Where is the chariot? Similarly, bhava bhava vinir mukta, bhava, existing things. In consciousness, where are existing things? Where is the universe in consciousness? Whatever you point out in the pot, here is the pot, you are touching the clay. This wooden table, huh? touch wood. I don't say touch table, because all of it is wood. Similarly, in consciousness, in you the consciousness, where is the universe? Where is the body? Where is the mind? He will say later on, the body is nothing but pure consciousness. See, the, we started by <laughs> differentiating not the body, not the mind, pure consciousness. Then we say everything else is, everything is pure consciousness. It's all one consciousness. But no body was ever born in pure consciousness. Just like no pot was ever born. No wave was ever born in water. You have to think in which, which sense. No part of the water ever became wave. Which part of the water is the wave? Is it the top of the water, the bottom of the water, the side of the water? Which part is wave? The whole of it? You take it in a jar, will it be a wave? No. It's a name and a form and a function, activity. That's what we do. So that's similarly, bhava bhava. No entity, no living being, non-living thing was ever born or created in consciousness. None ever died and is missed and is in the cemetery in consciousness. Consciousness is not the cemetery where everybody died and merged back. No. It's not born, did not die. One of our Swamis was very exercised with the idea of we as Hindus and Buddhists and Jains and Sikhs, we believe in multiple births. Punar Janma in Hindi. But Muslims, Christians um, and Jews, also atheists, one life. Of course, Muslim, Christians and Jews believe in eternal life. After death, they will be condemned. But life in this world is only one. So which one is true? Ek Janma ya Bahu Janma, Punar Janma. So he went to a great Advaitic master and asked him. He told me the story himself. So I went and asked that Swami. And he was very annoyed actually. So I went and asked that Swami, great teacher of Advaita Vedanta. So which is true? Many lives or one life? And that Swami answered, Are Mahatma Ji, jab janma hi nahi, to punar janma kahe ka ab manduk ke padiye. <laughs> oh monk, when there is no birth, where is the question of rebirth? Not even one life is there. Why? What, what about many lives? Neither one life nor many lives, not one but not many buts. Bhava bhava vinir muktaha. There is no things which exist, nor is there any absence of things. There is only consciousness. Then, sukhi bhava, sukhi bhava, be happy. You don't have to do anything right now, wherever you are, whatever you are, and whatever it will be in the future, be happy. Whatever was in your past, whatever is in the future, is as nothing compared to what is within you right now. So, be happy. How? How? Iti gyatva. Here's the crucial thing. By the knowledge of this. Not by the chanting of this. Not by the understanding of this. You must vividly, livingly feel, I am this consciousness. First of all, understand it beyond the slightest shred of doubt. Then stay with it. Morning, evening, night. As I am this awareness. You lose everything to reflect back to you. To me, the awareness, this is happening. This is appearing. And what is appearing is also nothing other than me, the awareness. Appearing in me, the awareness. Just like every wave is appearing in consciousness, in water. Every clay pot is born and exists and disappears in clay only. Similarly. 
Now he has given some wonderful verses, which I will chant and interpret the meaning, which you will realize immediately. Now you all know it. You know that you are the clay. You know that you are pure consciousness. And after that, we'll stop. And those who have to leave can leave. And then we'll have a few Q&A. A little bit of Q&A. Few verses, which Dhirishanji has quoted here. These are all from Aparokshanubhuti. Upadanam prapanchasya Brahmanonyanna vidyate tasma sarva prapanchoyam nachetarat. He says, yeah, it's in 54 at the bottom. These are just examples. They all say the same thing. Upadanam prapanchasya, the material of this prapanch of this universe. What's the usual Vedantic answer for the material of the universe? It is space, air, fire, water. No. He says, material of this universe is nothing other than Brahman, pure consciousness. It is consciousness alone. This, this, here, everything is consciousness alone. Anyad navidyat, there is nothing other than Brahman which can be the material of this universe. Tasmat sarva prapanchoyam nachetarat. This entire universe is nothing other than Brahman. Every bit of it is radiant with the presence of God. This, this universe. Ghatanam na yatha prithvi Patanam na hitantavaha Jagad nam na chida bhati Geyam tattada bhavataha It is this, the thread which is called cloth. It is um, the clay which is called the pot. It is Brahman, pure consciousness which is called world. By negation of the, of the pot concept, you come to clay. By negation of the cloth concept, you come to the thread which is made of. By negation of the world concept, you come to Brahman. Right here. Grihyamane ghate yadvad mittikayati vai balat vikshamane prapanchepi brahmheva bhati bhasuram a really beautiful verse. What does it mean? Follow this carefully. When you experience a pot, you see a pot, you touch a pot, you hold a pot. Huh? What are you experiencing? Clay. How? Balat. By force, you cannot avoid it. It is clay only. You cannot avoid touching the clay, seeing the clay. Huh? Because when you are whole touching or seeing a pot, what? It's clay only. When you're looking at the ocean, the wave, what are you in contact with? Water only. Similarly, he says, Viksha Mani. Viksha here means upon inquiry with this knowledge. Prapanchovi. This, this universe, idam, this one, when you inquire with the eye of knowledge, Brahmiva Bhati Bhasuram. What language? Brahman alone blazes forth. Bhasuram, like the sun shining. Brahman alone is blazing everywhere, here, all the time, unmitigated, unaltered undimmed. Brahmaiva bhati bhasuram. Brahman blazes forth in every experience of our life. That's why Vivekananda called it the open secret. Open secret. It's there. Once we see it for what it is, we we'll think, how did we miss it ever? It was always there. And that's why it's effortless. That's why it's unbroken. Sarvo pi vyavaharastu Brahmana kriya te janehi Agyana na vijanati Medevahi ghatadikam Everything that we do in life, we are doing with Brahman. Walk, talk, eat, fight, love, hate, everything. Wake, dream, sleep, everything. We are only, we are immersed in Brahman all the time. But we don't know it. Just like everything that you do with a pot, you are actually doing with clay. Put water in it, put milk in it, make it a flower pot, break it, it's, it's clay alone. Then last one. So the question is, why did we start off? You could have said this at the very beginning. Why did we start off by not the body, not the mind, I'm the witness consciousness. So much effort was put into, I'm not the body, not the mind. Why? Because unless you discover pure consciousness for what it is, the next step to see everything as pure consciousness will not work. First, you must discover. You must separate the pot from the clay in your understanding. Then see the clay as it is. Then realize the pot is nothing but clay. You must separate the water from the wave in your understanding. 
then see the water for as it is, then you will see the, uh, the wave, the ocean is nothing other than the water. You must separate awareness, existence, awareness, bliss from the world of names and forms and see it as it is, understand it as it is, you will see the universe as nothing but Satchidananda. So this verse. Yathaiva mrinmaya kumbha tadvad deho pi chinmaya atma atman atma vibho vibhagoyam atman atma vibhagoyam mudheiva kriyate budhehi so words huh? he has to make it poetry mudheiva kriyate budhehi the wise make this difference between body self and not self what is the difference the five koshas Annamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vigyanamaya, Anandamaya, not me, I am the witness. Waking, dreaming, sleep, not me, I am the witness of them. I am consciousness ever shining. This difference, why do they make? Is it, Buddha means in vain, is it in vain? Because ultimately the goal is oneness. So why are they making this dis distinction? He says, Yataiva Mrinmaya Kumbha, Deho Pitadvat Chinmaya. Uh, in order to understand the clay is nothing, the pot is nothing but clay. You must first understand what clay is, apart from all concepts of pot. Similarly, in order to understand, the body is nothing but pure consciousness, chinmaya. See, deho pi chinmaya. You must first understand what chinmaya means, pervaded by consciousness. You must first understand what chit is. Then you will see the body is pure consciousness, mind is pure consciousness, the pancha kosha, then atma will become kosha. The pancha kosha is nothing but pure consciousness. The entire universe is nothing but pure consciousness. But what is it? It's not a universe. It is pure consciousness alone. But appearing to itself as its object. This universe itself is pure consciousness. I'll end with a, just a single sentence. The, His Holiness, the Shankaracharya of Puri, Nishchalanda Saraswati. I heard on YouTube only I heard. He was talking and he, in a single sentence, he reduced the entire this, this, idam, this universe to pure consciousness. Pure consciousness, chin matra. Chin matra. In one sentence. But it's the panoptic vision, a sweeping bird's eye, not bird's eye, eagle's eye vision of entire Indian philosophy. So what does he do? He starts with the world. He starts with the pot. He starts with the world and ends with pure consciousness. Through a process of analysis in one sentence. I'll break it apart for you. The seven stages. Uh, I've mentioned it earlier also. This is Jagat, world. Which world? This one. Whatever you're seeing, hearing, smelling, taste. Jagat. Step one. Step two. Pancha Bhuta Vilasa. This is the play of five elements. Or in modern scientific language, we might say it is time, space, matter, energy. This is, we put together all of this. Number three. What are these five elements? Maya Vilasa. They have all come from Maya. I'm not explaining. Um, in Vedanta, they will say five elements have appeared from Maya. Maya Parinama, they would say. Maya Vilasa, the play of Maya or the expansion of Maya, the five elements. Number four, what is Maya? It's nothing apart from Brahman. It is the power of Brahman. Chid Vilasa is the play of consciousness, not the play of Maya. What is it? World. We're talking about world. Play of consciousness. Chid Vilasa. At this stage is entire Kashmiri Shaivism. Chid, Chid Vilasa. In fact, the head of the, the uh, yo, Siddha Yoga is now Chid Vilasananda. Swamini, Chit Vilasa, the play of consciousness. But does consciousness play? You might say poetically, but actually, can it vibrate? Can it change? Can it play? No. Things appear in consciousness. That's what happens. We see that. How does consciousness do anything? Things are experienced in consciousness. That's all. This is called vivartha. Consciousness, uh, things are appearing in consciousness. Consciousness is appearing as something. So, like a rope appearing as a snake. Chid vivartha, fifth stage. But if something is appearing as something else, if the rope is appearing as a snake, then that appearance snake, every bit of it must be the rope, must be pervaded by the rope. So sixth stage is chinmaya, pervaded by consciousness. It said, deho api chinmaya, the body is pervaded by consciousness. Everything here must be pervaded by consciousness. Sixth stage. But pervaded how? Is it like there's a hall, it's dark, switch on the light, light will pervade the hall. The hall existed without the light. The, the switch on the light, light pervaded the hall. 
Or there's a hall, you put on uh, incense, light the incense and the incense will pervade the hall. Is it like that? Or is it like this table and wood? Wood pervades the table, clay pervades the pot, water pervades the wave, which means the wave is nothing but water, pot is nothing but clay, this table is nothing but wood. Similarly, this world is nothing but consciousness. Seventh stage, chin matra, consciousness only. I'll repeat the seven stages quickly for you. Jagat, the world, start there. One. Pancha Bhuta Vilasa, play of five elements. Two. Maya Vilasa, play of the play of Maya. I have reduced it. You're using the term nothing but. Nothing but. One philosopher called it nothing buttery. <laughs> A lot of nothing buttery. So nothing but Maya, the play of Maya. Uh, then play of Maya is nothing but Chid Vilasa, the play of consciousness. Uh, that's where. Kashmiri Shaivism, even Bhakti, Leela, the whole Leela of the world. But that things do not, consciousness doesn't play, things appear in consciousness. Chid Vivatta. Then the six stages pervaded by consciousness, Chin Maya. And final stages, what do you mean by pervaded? It is consciousness only. Chin Matra. What? This world. Chin Matra. The word Chin Matra, you will notice, we have ended where we began. If you re remember the, the verse which we began with. First verse, we can chant it and end. Dikkal adhyana vachinna, Dikkal adhyana vachinna, Ananta chin matra murtaye, Ananta chin matra murtaye, Swanu bhutte kamanaya, Swanu bhutte kamanaya, Namashantaya tejase, Namashantaya tejase. Unlimited by direction, space, time, object, huh? limitless. What? Chin matra. That word which we used with. Yeah. Consciousness only, which is proved by your own experience. Which experience? All experience. Now, would you not agree? Every experience proves that I am consciousness only. The world is consciousness only. I salute that serene radiance. Shanta yateja senama. Which serene radiance? This. You do not see it, this is the world. If you see it, it is Brahman, pure consciousness. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Panamastu. What is the status time wise? There's no hurry. No okay. Those who want to leave because you might already have planes to catch or appointments and stuff like that. There's no hurry about Vedanta because <laughs> you are pure consciousness anyway. Huh. So please come and ask the question. Tell us your name and ask the question. I'm Usha Sharma. Yes. My question is, this is I'm still trying to get it, I guess. I have a rock-like intellect or whatever. <laughs> but um, whatever, no, it's getting in. So the question is, for myself, I can understand and I can understand all these people have the same Atma. How about when you hear about other people suffering, just war in Palestine and Israel or mm -hmm. Ukraine and Russia? I mean, do we not need to say, okay, the Atma is not suffering, it's only their body suffering and no, let but, it go. But then clearly there is suffering, right? Yes. Then the question arises, who is suffering? Then the question arises, who is there here right now, according to Advaita Vedanta? Atma. So. Then who is suffering? Atma is suffering. However, in your own case, knowing yourself to be the pure consciousness, you realize you are beyond suffering. See, when Sri Ramakrishna said, it is hurting, I cannot eat. Cancer? Was he pretending? No. Oh. Was it not hurting? It was hurting. Could he not eat? No, he could not eat. At the same time, as the witness consciousness, limitless Brahman, was he beyond suffering? Yes, that also. So both are true. Two arrows. Two arrows. Second arrow, suffering is removed by this knowledge. But will this cure disease? Will this stop war? No. That we have to make an effort in this world. And you can make a much better effort if you have this philosophy of oneness. I should not hate and fight against them. Why? Because they are me. Yes. So from this perspective, ethics, peacemaking, all of them can proceed better. But it will take effort. In this world, yeah. in this world of appearance, you have, your work, work is cut out for you. That first, the suffering of the first arrow, it will take work to remove. Okay. Yeah. 
No? So I still have to have compassion for those people. Of course, never interpret it in this sense that, oh, I'm pure consciousness. I can see that I am not suffering as pure consciousness. The poor fellow who has not eaten, but you are pure consciousness and hunger is no problem for you. You are the witness of the hunger. No, that is not the way to speak to other person. But as I remove the problems in my own body mind, I have hunger, I feed and I get fulfillment by eating when I'm hungry, even if I'm pure consciousness. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the hungry person there will be fulfilled if I offer food to him, though he is Brahman of pure consciousness. See, the, at the level of the world, activities will go on. Just because I'm pure consciousness, should I stop walking, talking, eating? No. Just because we know this is a movie, do I need to switch it off? No. Do I need to change the plot? No. So, yeah, our work in the world will go on. What is the application of this? You can ignore everything and remain absorbed in your nature as pure consciousness. That's also fine. Or you can be actively involved. Jivan muktas, enlightened beings, are of three categories. As far as the world is concerned, three categories. One is, they don't want to be aware of the world at all. They remain immersed in samadhi. I am pure consciousness. I keep my mind there. I will look at the wave, on, at the water only, not at the wave at all. I can do that. If you train your mind enough, your attention can stay there. Or the second category of enlightened person is the one who sees the water, but also sees the wave. And is full of joy at what a wonderful display all this is. There was a man, there was a sadhu who came to Dakshineshwar during Sri Ramakrishna's time. He would sit in his um, hut and meditate all day long. But once in a while, he would come out. In front is the Ganga, the sky, the temple. And he would say, wow, wow, wow. Wonderful, wonderful. Then he would go back to his uh, hut. The same one pure consciousness is appearing in this, all these ways. So the enlightened one is full of joy and amazement at the display of Brahman. That's the second kind of Jivan Mukta. These are the crazy people of God. You know, they're, they're always lost in a bliss. What is the phrase? Blissed out. <laughs> uh, and then there is the third kind of Jivan Mukta. The one who is engaged in the welfare of the world. Whose heart melts at the suffering of same Brahman appearing in all these ways. They are the ones who teach. They are the ones who serve. Swami Akhandananda, uh, disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, he established an orphanage. In, um, in a district of Bengal called Bharampur. There's an ashram called Sar. It's still now a very big ashram with a school and orphanage and everything. He established an orphanage. He taught the poor farmers there, most of whom were Muslims. Even till today, they are Muslims. So he taught them how to farm better. All of this he, he, he did. Now, a great scholar of Vedanta, Pramadadas Mitra, who lived in uh, Banaras, he wrote a sharp letter to him. Why are you doing all this? We know this because we have the reply from Akhandanji to Pramadadas Mitra. You have written to me, sir, that you are monks. Why are you doing all this? You should beg for your food and study the script texts, meditate and teach people. That's it. Why schools, orphanages? Why are you teaching people how to do modern farming and things like that? Akhandanji wrote back a fiery uh, letter. He said, if you are Brahman, what need is there to work for the freedom of, of Brahman? Brahman is free. You just see here what we just studied here. It's completely, nothing needs to be done. Nothing can be done also. And the same Brahman, which you are talking about, sir, I see that same Brahman walking around naked, hungry, without uh, illiterate. Yeah. And I will give up this life. Why this life? I will give up a thousand such lives to, in order to serve Brahman in all these forms. Fiery letter. But so from the same Vedantic insight. Thank you. Yes. Can you explain the difference between chit and chit? Chit and? Chit. Spell it? Like C-H-I-T. Hmm. It's a C-H-I-T-T. Yes. Okay. Chitta. Yeah. Chitta. Chit and chitta. Chit is pure consciousness. Chitta is mind. You can see it right now. If you close your eyes and think A, B, C, D. So the A, B, C, D which you thought just now, that's a thought in the mind. It's a thought in the mind. And you are aware of it. That this is an experience. I am thinking A, B, C, D. This awareness is possible because of Chit, pure consciousness, which you are. Remember, that awareness itself is not Chit. It's reflected in that thought. It's called reflected consciousness, a Chidabhasa. And it illumines that thought. It's like um, sunlight, moonlight, and the earth. The earth is like um, 
suppose on the moon there is a moon rover chandrayaan or something like that and by the same moonlight the moon is revealed and the that moon rover is also revealed so the moon rover is like the thought a b c d the mind is like the moon and moonlight is like the consciousness in the mind but the sun is pure consciousness chit moon is chitta sun is chit you are chit what you experience in the mind is chit technically uh, there is a saying chittam chiriti vijaniyat takara vishaya dhyasah chittam the mind what's the relationship between the mind and pure consciousness he says know the mind to be pure consciousness why not the body is pure consciousness which we read just now the mind is none other than pure consciousness then what is it that makes it the mind takara vishaya dhyasa very interesting if it's in sanskrit if you write chit and chitta it's only one letter ta you add one chit plus ta is chitta what is that ta takara vishaya dhyasa it is the superimposition of the object now it makes complete sense consciousness plus object is equal to experience what is that object it's a superimposition superimposition means what it is con- that object appearing consciousness al- appearing to itself as its own object it's not a separate thing the snake is a superimposition on the rope what does it mean the rope is the snake it appears as a snake it's not really a snake similarly pure consciousness appears as vishaya object and then pure consciousness alone appears as the mind Your mind can convert. You can believe it. Yes, Sri Ram Krishna says, "Shuddha mon, shuddha buddhi, shuddha atma ek." Your pure mind and pure consciousness are one reality. Yeah. Anu, uh, I have a my if a fearful mind or a curious mind has a question like if this is a dream within a dream that analogy. So are you? Inception saying, movie was there. Yeah, yes. Dream within dream. <laughs> Yes. So the final consciousness or awareness, call it Vishnu, is it a lonely single child doing a child's play? Hmm. And if my fearful mind asks this example, you give the arrow, and if we are in this dream with karma and time law, with the Vedantic knowledge, does it help to get the arrows feel like face the arrows better, or Vedantic knowledge vanishes the arrows? Yes. This is so many very profound questions. First one is, um, so is it a dream within a dream? Is there a final pure consciousness? Yes, it's not like a dream within a dream. There is no end to that. It's not like waking up. See, from a dream you wake up into the waking. So is that waking is also a dream? And there is another the higher waking which you will wake up to. Not like that. There is no end to it then. What this pure consciousness, witness consciousness, is final. Why is it final? Is it just because you say so? I will accept it as final. No. because whatever is final can is something that can never be denied yeah. all objects can be questioned and denied either this is waking or dreaming i can doubt it but i am experiencing it that i cannot doubt a dream is a dream we after waking we realize but i experienced it i cannot doubt it appeared to me in consciousness i am conscious that i cannot doubt so this consciousness is the ground of all experience if you tomorrow you experience a vision of god that also will require that you are conscious your consciousness is the ground of all experience that becomes final vedanta uses that that's undeniable uh, so next one is that um, will it be ultimately there is one vishnu one consciousness which is to which the whole universe is appearing it, there is and that's you is it a lonely child <laughs> there's nothing else yes it's a good way of looking at it uh, vishnu is called alone kevala uh, in sankhya in yoga enlightenment and freedom are called kaivalya aloneness but it is aloneness it's not loneliness shankaracharya says which is solitude this is this universe is solitude who else is there except you who else is there there is nobody else you are completely alone from eternity to eternity it's one consciousness is very lonely that's why you have created all this you have created all of us to play with you have done it because you are lonely <laughs> now there is only so that alan watts story which i mentioned many times you know i liked it uh, alan watts was this philosopher who was in the west coast somebody said part philosopher part pirate <laughs> so he said god 
existed from eternity to eternity and he got bored. It's a long time. Eternity is a long time. So God wanted to play. But there was nobody to play with. Nothing, nobody. So what could God do? Because God alone exists. Pure consciousness alone is there. So God thought about it. But God is very clever. So he got a, a solution. God pretended to be not God. And now there are two, God and pretending to be not God. So he started playing. Who is playing? God with not God. But God, not God, God pretending to be not God. But God is very good at what he does. So when he pretended to be not God, he forgot that he was God. <laughs> now he's searching for who am I? This is samsara. This is, this is, this is what is going on. Uh, so he's lonely. But, I mean, he is alone, but not lonely. One Christian mystic defines spiritual life as the flight of the alone to the alone. Alone small a to the capital A alone. Then will this knowledge help us to overcome the first arrow? Yes. We will be able to face the first arrow, old age, disease, death, all those problems with undisturbed internally. Those will keep coming. Now you can understand what Krishna said. Yang labdhvana chaparam labham manyate tato adhikam. Having attained which, you will not regard any other attainment as being greater. Having attained this, I am pure consciousness, you will not find anything in the universe which is more than this. Many things will keep happening to you, but you will not find anything more greater than this. This is the final and greatest. Then he says, Yasmin stito dukhena guruna pina vichalyate. Centered in which even the heaviest sorrows cannot shake you. No matter how many first, this first arrow is coming, it will not shake you. But it also means that those sorrows will keep coming. Like everybody else, it will keep coming. But you will not be shaken. Like Sri Ramakrishna, you will be able to say, oh, this problem is there, that problem is there. If somebody says, really? You will say, no, not really. Really, I'm fine. Yeah. Will it go away? Make it go away. Make it go away in the sense that nischaya. It will become a movie arrow for you. Yeah. In that sense, it's gone. All the problems in the movie are in one sense gone because they're in the movie. They will appear to you. You'll experience them. But for you, they're as good as non-existent. Yes. Yes. So this, this body is labeled as mother. Mm. Um, I try to understand the dynamics of clay and um, pot to understand that I need this body, mind, and intellect. Yes. That's the core assumption there. Absolutely. If that does not exist, I cannot understand it. Absolutely. Similarly, when I'm trying to understand the dynamics of consciousness and world of Maya, I still need this body, mind, and intellect. Absolutely. It's time to understand. Yes. So the question I have is this. When this body, mind, intellect is no more, which mm -hmm. is 100% certainty, would I still be able to experience the consciousness as a bliss or there will be no need to? Mm -hmm. the answer, direct answer there is there will be no need to. If would I still be able to experience? Certainly. Then you will generate more body, mind, and intellect. Huh. Now, see, question might be that, um, the, then don't I depend on the body? Mind? Somehow consciousness then depends on body, mind, and intellect to experience the world, even to become enlightened. Huh. Consciousness needs the body, mind, and intellect. So this was the insight of Sankhya philosophy. Purusha and Prakriti. It says Purusha and Prakriti are like a lame man and a blind man. The lame man cannot walk, the blind man cannot see. Uh, consciousness cannot do anything by itself. Absolutely useless, cannot do anything by itself. But you can see, experience. And the blind man is the is nature. It is no experience, it's, but it's uh, all matter, energy, everything is there. So what does the bl blind man do? Takes the lame man on his shoulders and then they can happily go along. The, the blind, uh, lame man will tell the blind man where to go and the blind man can walk. So similarly, Purusha and Prakriti, consciousness, and material nature. They cooperate for all this to happen, our experience of life. This is Sankhya. But Advaita goes one step further and says this so-called Prakriti is also nothing but consciousness. So consciousness does not depend on nature. Nature depends on consciousness. because The wave is nothing but water. In Sankhya, the two different entities, they are cooperating. The universe exists happily by itself. Consciousness exists happily by itself. They, con they uh, interact. Advaita says, the universe is nothing but that consciousness. The universe depends entirely on you, the consciousness. 
So you do not, you the consciousness do not depend on body, mind, intellect, except secondarily. It's rather body, mind and intellect which depends on you for its own existence and for its light, the awareness. Everything is given to you, it to it by you. You give it existence, you give it light and awareness, you give it value, meaning and purpose. Without you, there is no point to this universe. Without you, there is no experience in this universe. Without you, there is no existence of anything in this universe. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you said this body is called Madan. As you mind, but somebody, so when we read Vedanta, we become enthusiastic and we say, uh, I, the limitless consciousness with an overlay of body mind called, somebody wrote to me, uh, which is in this birth called Mr. Mishra is writing to you. So Vedanta says, always use common sense. I mean, just say Madan or Mr. Mishra. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I get many, many interesting and funny, lots and lots of emails. We are actually a whole team which goes through the emails and categorizes them into questions and things which can be answered. One of the many, many funny ones. One was, some people don't know, the English is a little poor. So I offer prostrations to you. I humbly offer prostrations to you. The, the, the email said, I hum humbly offer you my prostrate. <laughs> Gentlemen, yes. Pranam, Swamiji. My name is Satish. Uh, Swamiji, you were often taught about the four uh, purusharthas, uh, dharma, artha, kama, moksha. Uh, but I read somewhere uh, that uh, beyond moksha even uh, is the devotion can be understood as the fifth purusharta. Mm. I'm asking Swamiji, is that a valid way of thinking and how sure. are we to understand that? Sure, that, that is from the Vaishnava schools. The Vedanta has many schools. So what we are talking about is Advaita Vedanta. But however, this Vishishta Advaita, Dvaita Advaita, Dvaita Vedanta, Achintya Veda Ved, Shuddha Dvaita, multiple schools are there. So among them, at least one I know, Achintya Veda Ved, which is the philosophy of the uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, of which the ISKCON is uh, 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 you know, further evolution. So their conclusion is Bhakti is Panchama Purushartha, fifth Purushartha, higher than Moksha. Yeah, that is a beautiful way of thinking. I do not even want moksha. I want to enjoy the bhakti of the Lord, the sweetness of devotion and love. Why not? Yeah. Hmm. Like Mirabai and others. Uh, moksha, if you want, you can give moksha, but I am not asking for it. I just want that I should be able to love you and in life after lifetime also, I'm willing to be born. As long, I'm willing to suffer also. As long I, as I have unshakable devotion to you, O Krishna. That much I want. A very beautiful attitude. It's your attitude. However, one Swami told me, so what will happen? Um, uh, so that depends on Krishna. That does not depend on you. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Swami. Uh, Namaste, Swamiji. So my understanding of Advaita uh, Vedanta philosophy is that Brahman is non-dual. Yes. And everything, including this whole universe, the world, our actions, everything is Maya. And like we, you know, we somebody already said that we are witnessing a movie on the white screen. Mm. The actors are already mm. played their part, mm. and the movie is going to conclude whether we like it or not. So, having said all of that, then is there really a free will for human beings? Oh, that's and a big question. The, the added to that uh, that thought process: if everything is illumination of Brahman. Why is there a good Maya and then the bad Maya and all shades in between? Good and bad is not really good and bad. Sri Ramakrishna says Vidya Maya, Avidya Maya. Avidya Maya is that which traps us further and further in Maya. Traps in the sense, samsara will continue. And Vidya Maya is that which helps to liberate us from samsara. Spirituality, meditation, devotion, all of that. So, but your question of... Uh, if I just may uh, conclude my question. Yes. For free will. So, is there a really free will according to Advaita philosophy? And if there is none, to my understanding, none, then this classic teaching of you do good things in this life, you will get a better life next life. And how do you reconcile with that True. philosophy? So, free will question is a deep question. And it's a problematic question. Um, not just for Advaita, for any uh, religion, for any philosophy. So, right now also the debate is going on. I will not answer the question. I just give you basic uh, the conclusions because there is a lot to be discussed here. Uh, 
Um, just a few observations. One is, first of all, there is a new book out right now, which is making a lot of impact. Have you heard of it? Uh, Determined. It's called Determined. It's not very expensive also, published by Penguin. Um, Saposky, Richard Saposky, I think. Let's look it up. Determined. He says, after all neuroscience and philosophical investigations, cognitive science investigations, we come to the conclusion there is no free will. There is no free will. From a scientific perspective, not from philosophical, I mean, not from spiritual perspective, there's really no free will. Now he says, how do we live now? <laughs> what is the implication for us? So Richard Sapolsky, S-A-P-O, Sapolsky, S-A-P-O-L-S-K-Y. Robert, Robert, sorry, thanks for the correction. Robert Sapolsky. Determined? Yes. The Science of Life Without Free Will. That's the name of the book. Determined. Uh, determine the science of life without free will. Um, so what is the Advaita Vedanta's position? Ultimately, is there free will or not? No, there's no free will. Vivekananda says, free will is a contradiction in terms. There is freedom. Brahman is always free. But will is something that comes much later when the mind and uh, you know intellect mind, they have evolved already. Jiva is already there. You're asking whether when I'm making choices, am I free? I have the sense of freedom. Okay. So that's the answer to your question directly. But then that makes a big problem for us because we assume free will for everything. Our religion assumes free will. If you say, do this and don't do that, that means I have a choice. Otherwise, why will you tell me? Hold instruction, Gita, uh, Krishna. Uh, um, it's telling you, do this, don't do that. All the religions have do's and don'ts. Our entire judicial system depends on free will. You cannot punish a person unless there is free will. Uh, you cannot give a reward for a medal for bravery unless it is free will. Isn't it? Our entire economic system, choice, advertisement, depends on free will. You're choosing to buy something or not buy, then only I can influence your choice. That's why advertisement works. That is the basis of modern capitalist economy. So, on one hand, everything depends on free will, our life. And yet, neuroscience and philosophy... And uh, things like Vedanta, uh, spirituality, they're all saying there's no free will. I'll leave you with that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you, Swamiji. Uh, my name is Sandhya, and uh, my question is um, a little bit related to what the previous question was, and that is, is there consciousness without humanity? Mm. Because it's the human mind that is telling us about the consciousness. There is no human mind and humanity without consciousness. Mm -hmm. So consciousness is ubiquitous. Now it is already, not doesn't take Vedanta or Sankhya for, for this. Now even science is beginning to come around. There are theories like panpsychism, David Chalmers is proposing that consciousness is ubiquitous in this universe. Even the leading theory of consciousness right now, which is not right by the way, but it's leading theory, information, uh, integrated information theory, uh, IIT. <laughs> Tononi, which speaks about a basal level of consciousness in everything. So it's not at all the human mind which has only got consciousness. Consciousness is there everywhere. So the meaning of consciousness is uh, related to the human mind's interpretation of what it is. No. And is consciousness also the same as God, which is also a construct of the human mind? Yes. But the meaning of consciousness, see, even when the human mind is not functioning, say in deep sleep, that's also an experience. How is it reported? Is the mind is, is shut down there. So consciousness is prior to the human mind. Even when the mind is not functioning, even when you still the mind in meditation or you fall asleep or something, consciousness is still there. Not only that, human, why human mind? All the higher animals clearly have consciousness. Uh, Anil Seth, who's a neuroscientist, he pointed out that deep blue might, might be more intelligent than the mouse. But the mouse can suffer. Deep blue cannot suffer. Deep blue computer, chess computer, it cannot suffer. So if you, anywhere you see suffering, pain, pleasure, consciousness is there. It's an experience. Any first person experience means consciousness is there. So it requires life. Uh -huh. So there is the big question. Can there be consciousness without life? So this biologist who is a philosopher of mind, Massimo, he said to me, his argument against me was, he said, uh, I think consciousness is possible only in living brains. He didn't say human brain. Any living brain can be conscious. But without living brain, there can be no consciousness. Which means you're saying that 
artificial intelligence and all, they can never become conscious. Does it require life? Um, we, Vedanta will say the opposite. Advaita Vedanta will say life requires consciousness. Anything requires consciousness because it's all an appearance in consciousness. Hmm. One thing though, right now when we're talking about consciousness in consciousness studies and also in Vedanta, when we talk about consciousness, know it for sure, no matter how much you think you've understood it, almost certainly you're thinking of consciousness plus mind. Hmm. What you think is consciousness is consciousness plus mind. Know it for sure. If you truly, truly understand what consciousness is, next moment you'll be enlightened because it's constantly present in front of you. If I don't know what, what is a mobile phone, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, people didn't know. If they see this also, they won't understand what it is. Right? But the moment you're told this is a mobile phone, oh, this is it. Because I'm seeing it already. Similarly, Atman, pure consciousness, it's already within our experience. It is the basis of all our experience. If we clearly understand what it is, next moment enlightenment. That's why in Vedanta we are told, what is the main practice? What should I focus on? They say Shravana. Many people say, we must meditate, meditate. No, no, no. In Vedanta they say, hear, hear, listen again, listen again. I have listened, I have understood. Next what? If you say next what, you have not understood. Hmm. It's like saying, I am limitless consciousness, Brahman, I am one with the universe. Now what? <laughs> you have not understood. So hear, hear, keep on hearing, listening. Yes. Oh, the, the gentleman, yes. Namaste. My name is Som. Um, what we struggle with, uh, especially studying Vedanta in the Western world, is use of English. And we have we are told repeatedly, oh, no, no, go back to the original Sanskrit. And this discussion about consciousness, actually, that's what brings to mind. Is Chaitanya a better way to understand consciousness, like we earlier talked about Chit. Is Chaitanya a better way coming from Sanskrit to understand consciousness? Or is there another word in Sanskrit which can help us better grasp consciousness? Hmm. There is no word in English which corresponds to what Vedanta wants to say. So the closest we can get is consciousness, awareness. These are the two words, awareness or consciousness. In Sanskrit, there are many words. Chit, Chaitanya, Bodha, um, Samvit, Chiti, all of this, these are words for pure consciousness. They have very precise meaning. All of them mean the same thing. It's like they say that Eskimos have some 20 words for snow or something they say. <laughs> because you live in that environment, you know the various gradations of it and you have many words to describe it. In the English, you have only snow, ice, hail, things like that. Um, Similarly, these people did philosophy for such a long time, and this inquiry into the self, they came up with various terms. So they are multiple words and they are precise. But uh, language, uh, you have to work with language. What can you do? When you're in Sanskrit, how many people can? And another thing is, language can mask also. I remember there was this most difficult text of Advaita Vedanta, Khandana Khanda Khadya, Sri Harsha. Hmm. Now, there's a translation by an American professor, a lady, Phyllis Granoff. Uh, she translated that. It's called Argument in Late, Late Vedanta. The, only a small portion of Kandana Khanda Khadya, that book, uh, by Sri Harsha, who wrote it about a thousand years ago, uh, 11th century. So she translated it. And, and an Indian Pandit also translated it into Bengali. And I asked my master, one of my teachers, Acharyas, which translation is better? And the Pandit was his teacher, my master's teacher. And he took both translations, the one by the American professor here into English and the other one into Bengali from the Sanskrit original. He came back and he said sheepishly, the English translation is better. The reason is, in Indian languages, you can use almost similar words from Sanskrit, which do not really explain anything. Because the same words are there in Indian languages, in Bengali, in Marathi, in uh, uh, Hindi, in uh, you know Kannad. The same words are there. Mm -hmm. Whereas in English, if you have to explain that, that thing, you have to understand very deeply and then translate and give copious footnotes to you know, make sure the meaning is coming across. You have to work much harder. Yeah. But the limitations are always there. Thank you. Um, in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 22, Sri Krishna says, 
by me in my unmanifest form, the entire universe is perverted. perverted. All creatures are in me, mm. but I am not in them. Yeah. Exactly that? this. Maya tatam idam sarvam jagad abhyakta murtina matsthani sarva bhutani nacham tesho avasthit nacham matsthani bhutani pashyami yoga mashvaram by my unmanifest form I as pure consciousness pervade this entire universe. All beings are in me but I am not in all beings. What does it mean? So this all the characters and objects in the movie are appearing in the screen. They are all on the screen. But the screen is not in them. So they don't exist. It's not that there's a bottle and in them there's water. So there is a being and in it full stuffed with consciousness. No. They're all in me. But I am not in them. And then he goes one step further. They are not in me. He flat out contradicts himself. So what it means is they are all appearing in me. They are not really in me. Pashyame Yoga Maishwaram. This is the power of Yoga Ishwara is Maya. This is the power of Maya. I project myself as this universe. Exactly what was taught here. Sri Krishna. It's Bhagavad Gita. Sri Krishna has said that. Ninth chapter. As she said. Pranam Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, in the examples we talked Okay, that has to be the last question. The gentleman. You know, you, you should ask. You should be the last person. Because we have to all go. In the in the examples we took, Maharaj, the clay and the pot and the, even the waves and water, the 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 pe- the cause is also matter and the effect is also matter. Hmm. Uh, whereas when we relate that to our experience, consciousness, which we say that it's not a matter, yeah. even mind is a matter, right? Mm-hmm. So where there is that connection between the that's why you take uh, think about it uh, seriously. That sevenfold reduction. Notice it does not start with experience. I started with our experience of the world because it's easy to reduce to consciousness. Right. I cheated. But look at that uh, reduction from Jagat to pure consciousness. It word. starts with material world, reduces it to fundamental matter, right. then goes from that to Maya, which is a power, from that to consciousness, then refines the nature of consciousness and comes to consciousness only. Yeah. Yeah. We are getting there. There's, there's a dialogue which will come up between me and Donald Hoffman. So he's a professor in UC Irvine. He's coming up with some very cutting edge theories, which I barely, even, I can't wrap my mind around, uh, from evolutionary neuroscience, from cognitive science, and from some kind of cutting edge mathematics and uh, particle physics, um, where he wants to show the whole thing, the universe is basically, first of all, an appearance, and an appearance in consciousness. Thank you. So, my question was like, what is the difference between the philosophy of Srimad Bhagavad Gita and Vedanta? Because in Vedanta. Okay, let me answer that straight away. Difference between Srimad Bhagavad Gita and Vedanta. So, Vedanta, the root, the textual root of Vedanta is Upanishads. If you say different definition of Vedanta, Vedanta Nama Upanishad Pramanam, the source of spiritual knowledge called Upanishad is Vedanta, literally. Vedanta is equal to Upanishads, textually. Now, what is Bhagavad Gita? So, uh, Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Sutras, they are all based on the Upanishads. So, the triple foundation, Prasthanatraya for Vedanta, Upanishad, Gita, and Brahma Sutra. So, Gita is one of the textual basis of Vedanta. So, in Vedanta, we are talking about the uh, consciousness, right? And all the consciousness, uh, those are talking about like me and everyone else, all are in the same. Like in everyone is inside me, or I am in everyone. Kind of As way. consciousness. Yes. In Gita, Sri Krishna is saying that he is in everyone. Hmm. So doesn't it somewhere it boils down to like me and everyone else is inside Sri Krishna? Yes, and, and is Krishna. not only inside, identical with Sri Krishna. Yes, yes it boils down to that. So, that is the meaning of Aham Brahmasmi. Yes, and so basically that is devo- like he is saying that Sarva Dharman So we are we are giving everything to the to Sri Krishna, right? So that's basically devotion. Hmm. So devotion is Karma Yoga. It's the main 
you know, you are spreading around like oil, oil on water. <laughs> So yeah, what I is the question? So basically, I am saying that then karma yoga is everything. So what is the difference between different yoga? They are they are boiling down to one yoga that is karma. Yoga. We'll talk about it later. I didn't question. The question has to be refined. <laughs> have to be made more precise. The question has to be refined. Yes, the last question. <laughs> We will follow you on the YouTube for a long time. It's a pleasure to see you in person over here. And thank you for coming to this talk. Um, we, you've been talking about um, a consciousness in a very profound, magnanimous manner. And we have only a small mind here to understand that thing. First of all, is our mind truly capable of understanding what you've been talking about? No. However, you are capable because you are that consciousness. <laughs> what the mind can do is generate the knowledge which will remove the ignorance in the mind, that which says that we are not that pure consciousness, that I am not Brahman, I am body-mind. This ignorance can be removed by knowledge and the knowledge that knowledge can be generated in the mind. But the mind can never objectify pure consciousness. Secondly, is there something beyond the mind that you can enter to understand the consciousness? No. Beyond the mind is consciousness itself. Like the, is you. I'm talking about, like, talk about Turiya. Yes, correct. That is Turiya is pure consciousness. Turiya is pure consciousness. What is Turiya literally means four. In Sanskrit, Chaturtha. So Turiya is four. Four means waker one, dreamer two, deep sleeper three. The witness of all these three is Turiya, pure consciousness. Waker and waking world, one. Dreamer and the dream world, two. Deep sleeper and the blankness, potential darkness of deep sleep. And the witness to whom all these three appear and disappear, that is the fourth. That is pure consciousness. That is awareness. That's what we are talking about. One more thing. Oh, one more. <laughs> the meditation that you mentioned yesterday, the Vedanta meditation. Are there different kinds of meditation? Or is it one meditation and the end result is the same? Well, there's a vast range of meditative techniques. There's yogic meditation. There are variations of this yogic meditation, a whole range in Buddhism. In Buddhism, different schools of Buddhism have different meditation techniques. There are meditation techniques in uh, Christian mysticism. Um, Jainism has a whole range of meditation techniques. So Hinduism has many meditation techniques in Tantra, in Yoga. And Vedanta has its own meditation that is Nididhyasana, Vedantic meditation. But the end result, is in the same? Is there different ways to get to meditation? Um, it's a good question. You put it this way. What is common to all of them? Don't say end result is the same. What is common? Basic thing that's common to all techniques of meditation is to uh, is control over your power of attention. In all techniques of meditation, basically you're taking charge of attention, where your attention is going. That's the minimum, common minimum factor. Different means to get to it. Mm, different means of taking charge of your attention. Okay. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu very good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Take care.